All right. Well, thanks for everybody getting back on time. So, again, for those of you that may have just joined us in the public, we're on the American Ale Management Board, and um, we're on agenda, agenda item six, consider draft addendum four for public comment. Uh, Kate Taylor is going to provide an overview, and then we'll have board discussion. Kate? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just for a little bit of background, um, as you know, the board approved the original FMP for American Eel in 1999. In uh, 2006, the board initiated uh, draft addendum two to propose measures to facilitate escapement of silver eels on their spawning migration with the intent of halting further declines in juvenile recruitment and eel abundance. In September 2008, at annual meeting 2008, the board delayed management action on addendum two in order to incorporate the results of the benchmark stock assessment into the management process. Um, the board initiated the stock assessment, um, which was approved um, in May 2012. And in response to the findings of the stock assessment, the board initiated draft addendum three, um, which was approved in August 2013 um, and did focus mostly on the commercial yellow and silver eel fisheries as well as the recreational fishery. Um, additionally, at that time, the board initiated this addendum, draft addendum four, to focus on the coastwide glacial quota, monitoring requirements, enforcement measures and penalties, transferability, timely reporting, and the New York silver eel weir fishery. Um, and just as a, a reminder, additionally, there is currently a petition under consideration by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to list American eels on the, in the, under the Endangered Species Act. Um, and the Fish and Wildlife Service is expected to have that um, decision to be released in September 2015. Since the development of the FMP, landings of yellow eels have been around 1 million pounds. Um, in 2013, um, thanks to the uh, updated data provided by the states, um, we uh, have the landings information for 2013, which was about 900,000 pounds, and this was a 17% decrease in landings from 2012. Regionally, there has been um, generally an increase in landings in the mid-Atlantic region um, in about the past decade, and declining trends generally seen in the northern and southern portions of the range. Um, so that's kind of where we are um, with the status of the fishery in the U.S. The board had also requested some information on management of uh, European eels um, within the European Union as well as American eels in Canada by uh, DFO. Um, just for reference, um, in, uh, within the European Union, the European eel stock is considered severely depleted. In 2007, the EU passed regulations um, to develop national eel management plans for all the EU countries at the river level basin. Um, and this was the requirements of these plans was to allow for 40% of eels to outmigrate for spawning purposes. And one of the other goals in the, the national eel plans was to use 60% of their catch of glass eels for those countries with a glass eel fishery for restocking purposes. Um, however, in September 2013, uh, the Parliament has requested the European Commission um, look at new regulations to help um, further uh, stop the decline of the European eel. Um, and specifically, these new regulations are looking to close the loopholes um, that allow for continued overfishing and illegal trade of glass eels. Um, also, to evaluate the current restocking stocking measures um, that are in place within the EU countries at, at this time and to, to assess whether there's actually any contribution um, or benefit of restocking to glass seal recovery um, and also to require member states that do not comply with the reporting and evaluation requirements of um, the 2007 regulations to reduce their eel fishing effort by 50 percent. And the, um, e, uh, the European Commission is expected to review uh, the new proposed regulations this summer. Um, and also just for uh, reference, for comparison to the U.S. landings, this shows the um, landings in Europe. Um, landings peaked at around 40 million pounds in the 1950s and 1960s. Major fisheries currently do occur in the Netherlands, France, Sweden, and the U.K. Um, and in 2012, the commercial harvest was estimated at about 5.2 million pounds and the recreational harvest at 1.1 million pounds. 
Um, additionally, as Sheila mentioned earlier, um, the EU does have some information on recruitment going back to the 1950s, and this shows the, the general trend of the um, uh, recruitment in the south and central region and then the northern region in Europe um, over the last uh, 50 or 60 years. I'm looking to Canada, um, populations of American eel are widespread in eastern Canada, um, but there have been dramatic declines that have been seen throughout the range, including Lake Ontario and the upper St. Lawrence. Um, in 2010, um, there was a national management plan for American eel um, developed, and the short-term goal of this plan was to reduce all eel mortality from all anthropogenic sources by 50% um, relative to the 1997-2002 average, and the long-term goal would be to include um, rebuilding overall abundance uh, of American eel populations in Canada to its mid-1980s levels. And this is just showing the landings um, as reported by DFO. Um, they uh, declined through the early 1960s and increased to a peak in the late 1970s and have since declined to the lowest level in recent history. So kind of just overall, the international management of eels have looked at and implemented management measures similar to the measures that this commission has considered considered over the past decade, including seasonal and area closures, size limits, um, license cap, gear restrictions, lowering the recreational bag limit, trying to reduce effort, um, closing fisheries, working to reduce illegal harvest, trying to increase fish passage, and also looking at restocking measures. Um, kind of bringing it back to our stock here, as Sheila previously mentioned, the TC and SAS looked at the update trends in recruitment um, and found no change in the status of our stock, um, which leads us to the management options in draft addendum four that the PDT has um, worked on over the past uh, many months. So to begin with the glass eel fishery, um, option one would be the status quo. Um, option two is to, uh, is the 2014 management measures. Under this option, the current 2014 fishing regulations for glass eel fisheries in Maine and South Carolina would become the new status quo, and these would be required to be maintained um, going forward. Um, the board may choose to implement this option for one or both of these states, so only for Maine, only for South Carolina, or for both. And that's kind of, that is uh, something that comes up in the other options as I move forward. Um, option three is a closure of the glass eel fishery um, for Maine and South Carolina. And this would either be delayed um, at the board specified time frame or an immediate closure. Option four is a quota based on landings, and there are three options. Um, the first is using the average landings from 2004 to 2013. The option 4B is a 20% reduction from this 2004 to 2013 level. And option C would be to use the harvest reported in 2010. Um, this, uh, these sub-options um, are on page 13 of the addendum, and the total quota allocated to both Maine and South Carolina would be about 8,200 pounds um, to 3,300 pounds under the different options with about 95% allocated to Maine and 5% uh, the remainder allocated to South Carolina. And again, the board may choose to implement this option for either one or both of the states. Um, and as we go through some additional options, you could implement those as well. <laughs> um, Option five is uh, dealing with quota overages. If the board implements quota management, they can consider options to address quota overages. Um, this would be equal payback if the overages occur. The state will be required to deduct their entire overage from the quota the following year, pound for pound. Um, and there, would be an, there could be an overage tolerance of up to 5%, which would be allowed um, without payback. Um, option six deal, deals with quota underages, and this would allow states with a glass eel fishery um, up to 25% of the unused quota may be added to the state's quota the following year, and any quota that is rolled over can only be used in the following year um, and cannot be carried over for um, subsequent years. Um, it is not, uh, just going back to the 5% um, overage allowance, it's not intended that this would allow uh, or would be utilized every year. Um, it just, in consistent overages would um, require management board action. 
Option seven, um, as we previously uh, began to discuss, is the aquaculture quota. Under this option, the board may choose to allocate a percentage of the total quota for approved aquaculture purposes. Um, this amount would first be deducted from the total glacial quota, and then the remainder of the quota would be distributed as specified um, under the option. And so... Um, there is an example that's given in the addendum, um, and also it kind of, as uh, Mitch was kind of requesting some information earlier, it does allow the board to um, uh, determine who would receive the quota, and there are specific measures um, under this option that say, states um, how requests for quota would be submitted to the board and then also um, reviewed. Option eight in the addendum deals with aquaculture permitting. And so any harvest of glass seal for commercial aquaculture purposes must be collected under an approved aquaculture permit issued by the state or jurisdiction that the collection will occur in and is subject to any monitoring and reporting requirements as specified by the jurisdiction. Um, and so this is an option that the board considered outside of the aquaculture quota if it decided to. Option nine would increase the reporting requirements, specifically would implement daily trip level reporting with daily electronic accounting to the state for harvesters and dealers in order to ensure accuracy, accurate reportings of glass seal harvests. And the PDT stresses that this would uh, likely be necessary if a quota system was implemented, um, as we previously discussed earlier in the main elver fishery. Um, and option 10 includes uh, recommendations for monitoring requirements, specifically that states or jurisdictions with a commercial glass seal fishery must implement a fisheries independent life cycle survey covering glass, yellow, and silver eels within at least one river system. And the PDT and TC has currently worked to develop some of those methodologies um, and we could work with the state to um, implement those uh, monitoring requirements and provide information as needed. Moving on to the yellow eel fishery, option one is the status quo. Option two would be to implement a quota based on landings. Um, based on the discussions from the board at previous meetings, um, the PDT has developed a criteria in the application of distribution of the quota. Um, the first is that states be allocated a minimum of a 2,000 pound quota. This is not expected to promote a notable increase in effort, um, but will hopefully reduce some of the administrative burden in um, uh, monitoring quota. Um, the second criteria would be that no state is allocated a quota that is more than 10,000 pounds above its 2010 harvest level. And the third is that no state or jurisdiction is allocated a quota that is more than a 15% reduction from its 2010 harvest level. So using these criteria will hopefully minimize some of the impact in, in quota allocations that we do see with the variabil variability in landings from year to year. So there were three um, options for quotas that are presented under this option. Um, the first is using the 2010 landings. The second is a 10% reduction from the landings. And the third is a 20% reduction from the landings. Um, the board received a handout at the start of this meeting um, with some revisions to the quota based on updated landings. Um, under this option, there, there was a, an increase of a few hundred pounds to New Jersey, Delaware, and Florida under the no reduction alternative, but the, the rest remain the same. So under this alternative, uh, the total coast-wide um, quota ranges from about 980,000 pounds to 870,000 pounds um, with the allocation percentages divided up um, as specified in the, the table. Option three is a weighted yellow eel quota option. Um, the PDT worked with a few volunteer commissioners to develop an alternative quota allocation method. Like the previous option, um, the total coastwide quota is based off of the 2010 harvest level, and there are options for a 10 and a 20% reduction um, from that harvest level. Um, the difference is under this option, um, the allocation to states is based on a weighted distribution. Um, the first, the three highest landings um, from the period 2004 to 2013 were averaged um, by state, and these were weighted at 30%. Um, this was combined with the average landings by state um, from 2011 to 2013, and this was weighted at 17%, uh, 70%. 
And so under these options, um, the total coastwide quota ranges from 980,000 to about 780,000. And again, on the flip side of that handout, um, there are some revised quotas under this options that differ from what appeared in the uh, draft addendum in the briefing material. Um, roughly, North Carolina and Florida had their quotas reduced by around two to 4,000 pounds, um, and that 6,000 pounds was distributed amongst the rest of the states just due to an error. Um, but this revised table, if um, approved for the addendum, would go and be replaced in the draft addendum for public comments. Option four and option five um, can be implemented if the board chooses a quota management system. Option four deals with quota overages. If the overage occurs, the state would be required to reduce their following year's quota by the same amount. Um, option five is for quota transfers. States or jurisdictions implementing a commercial quota for American Eel could request approval for transfer of all or part of its annual quota to one or more states. Um, but the states that receive the automatic 2,000 pound quota would not be eligible to participate in this transfer. Um, option six focuses on a coastwide catch cap. Again, this would be based off of the 2010 harvest levels, like the previous options. Um, under this option, states and jurisdictions would be allowed to fish until the cap is reached. Once the cap or threshold is reached, um, all states and jurisdictions would be required to close all directed fisheries and prohibit landings. Um, one of the benefits of the catch cap is that it reduces the administrative and legislative burden of implementing state-specific quota systems, as described in the previous options, while still controlling the total amount of fishing mortality that is occurring annually. Um, additionally, a coast-wide cap does not require a specific allocation by state or jurisdiction, which can be problematic due to the fluctuations situations and landings um, uh, that, that occur as a result of environmental and market conditions. However, the PDT notes that under the um, uh, catch cap system, um, the only uh, that timely reporting would still be needed, um, most likely daily, in place to ensure to, that the cap was not exceeded. Additionally, if the cap was exceeded, the only payback mechanism um, would equally impact all states involved in the fishery, even if the overage occurred um, or was largely the result of one state. Um, and also, a mort mortality cap may promote a derby-style fishery, um, which could possibly flood the market and drive down prices. And lastly, implementation of a mortality cap could result in early coastwide closures and eventual elimination of historic and profitable fisheries that are prosecuted later in the year. And there is a graph in the document um, that uh, shows the landings by month coastwide. And under these options for the coastwide uh, catch cap, um, as I mentioned, there is the harvest at the 2010 levels at 978,000 pounds, and then a 10 and a 20% reduction from that level. Uh, moving on to the silver eel options, um, as the board remembers, under Addendum 3, states and jurisdictions are required to implement no take of eels from September 1st through December 31st from any gear type other than baited pots and traps or spears. Um, these gears can, may still be fished, but retention of eels was prohibited. Um, New York was granted a one-year exemption from the requirements under Addendum 3 so that their fishery could be addressed in Addendum 4. So option one is the status quo. The current regulations would remain in effect, and the one-year exemption would expire on December 31st, 2014. Option two would be an extension of this sunset provision at a time frame specified by the board. Option three would be for um, a time closure, and specifically no take of eels in the Delaware River and its tributaries within New York from August 15th through September 30th from any gear type other than baited pots and traps or spears and weirs. Um, this is, for example, um, bike nets and pound nets. And the, the table here just shows the average landings by, by month and the impact that um, this option might have. Option four would be a license cap, and under this option, the Delaware River weir fishery would be limited to those permitted New York participants that fished and reported landings any time during the period from 2010 to 2013. And once a license is issued, they would not be eligible for trans transferability, and only one license can be issued per participant. Um, additionally, the board had requested the PDT look at um, transferability and um, allowances for glacial quotas for states that currently do not have them. 
Um, the PDT analyzed many different options and um, the best strategy that they had for um, addressing these two requests was the development of state sustainable fishing plans. So under these plans, states or jurisdictions would be allowed to manage their American eel fishery through an alternative management program to meet the needs of their current fishermen while providing conservation benefit for the American eel um, population. Um, the basis for these programs is the Shad and River Herring plans and also kind of as an example, the European Union um, country specific plans that they have developed um, uh, overseas. Um, the, TD, the TC does caution that the American Shad and River Herring plans, as well as the European eel management plans, were, you know, were initiated recently and is difficult to evaluate the effects. Um, but this would have uh, the ability to support eel populations and um, also uh, get information on the, the life cycles um, and life cycle monitoring for American eel. So specifically under these plans, states must be able to assess with some level of confidence the status and abundance, uh, status of abundance and the level of mortality that is occurring within their jurisdictions. And then once documented, states would be allowed to allocate that fishing mortality to any American eel fishery um, that they choose, even if the state does not currently participate in that fishery. Um, and they also might, um, they would be allowed to allocate it for aquaculture or research purposes. Um, and states would be allowed to increase the fishing mortality rate provided it is offset by decreases in other mortality through habitat improvement, restoration programs, increasing fish passage, um, so that there is an overall net gain to conservation. So basically under this plan, it would allow states to, um, if they could assess their level of mortality, to then allocate it as they um, would like to either a glass, a yellow or a silver eel fishery, or for aquaculture or restoration uh, or research purposes. And it would also them allow them to petition the board um, and technical committee to take into consideration any habitat improvements that the state has um, implemented and use that to to, um, increase their fishing mortality or increase their quota or increase um, whatever management measure they choose to implement. There is also an option, um, kind of a sub-option under this state sustainable fishing plan for a kind of a transfer plan to address transferability here. Um, so if states are unable to assess the current level of mortality and abundance with certainty, um, which the TC and PDT notes might be difficult for um, some systems, um, if that is the case and the board chooses to adopt quota management, then a state would be allowed to develop a specific sustainable fishing plan to request a transfer of quota from one fishery to another. So you could transfer from a yellow to a glacial fishery based on the life history characteristics inherent to that area. Um, and again, the states that are allocated a minimum of the 22,000 pound quota would not be eligible for this transfer um, provision. Um, the law enforcement also weighed in on some of the options um, under consideration in this addendum to provide information to the board. Um, the law enforcement committee found that the status quo measures for all eel fisheries is impractical for enforcement, um, specifically for the glass eel fishery, given the enforcement challenges associated with the prosecution of the fishery in those states that currently um, close to harvest of glass eels. Um, a quota system would be difficult to enforce, although enforceability depends largely on how quota systems are managed managed, increasing the complexity of the quota system would generally reduce enforceability. Keeping it simple is preferable. And the enforcement of time area closures for the silver eel fishery is considered a reasonable alternative. Um, the Law Enforcement Committee recommends that specific changes um, to regulations to enhance field enforcement or, and or penalties um, are encouraged by the states and those that have already been implemented as we discussed earlier um, like in the state of Maine really have improved the outcome of arrests and convictions within those states. Um, additionally, because of the cross-state nature of illegal glass seal harvest, strengthening of extradition or bail provisions for criminal violations would greatly enhance the deterrent effect for en enhancement. Uh, enforcement actions. Um, so if approved for public comment today, the public hearings um, would be held um, over the summer with the board considering final approval at the August meeting. And that is my presentation on the draft addendum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great job, Kate. A lot of information there. Um, 
So, uh, you know, there's, there's, I think, a total of 21 options currently in the addendum, and I think just to try to facilitate our discussion, I think we should first focus on any like clar clarifying questions of the options, and then we can get into options that people feel like should be dropped or added. Dan? Um, it may be a question, it may be a comment. Um, when this goes to hearing, it seems to me that you want the public to say things like, I want option one or option two, but some of these options are not mutually exclusive, and I, I think, especially in the glass seal section, I don't think those should all be independent options, since clearly they're, they're not. There are some of them are linked, so is it possible to rewrite the, that section when, when something is not mutually exclusive to just make it a proposed plan provision so that the public doesn't lo zero in on choosing one or the other when actually you could choose a set of them? And that's very common in um, ASMSC documents. Um, and it says in the addendum for like option six, the quota overages, or option five, the underages, or op option seven, that you know it's applicable only if specific ones are taken. But the rest are you know not mutually exclusive, and that's something that um, is easy to get across that I've done many times in public hearings. So I can do that. I still think you should rewrite it. I don't think you should have ten options. In, in something if you're not asking for, for the choosing of one. I think you should rename them as something other than options. Call them proposals. Just but options to me is now I'm choosing do any 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 other folks feel that way? David? Yeah, this is, has come up before and I've suggested using the term issue. Issue number three is quota management or um, monitoring as distinct from how are we going to allocate. So something to think about, because I, I find it confusing too, when option 10 really doesn't relate to option 2, it's not an alternative, it's a different subject. So maybe issue. Rob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Kate, and not to that uh, particular conversation, but um, since this is going to the public, and originally it was going to be one addendum. I don't see a lot, in case I missed it, about addendum three requirements. There's a statement in the, uh, in the options, the management options, that talks about these regulations will be implemented in combination with what was specified under addendum three. So that's on page 10. There is reference under silver eels to one of the adopted measure, but I think the public would benefit from knowing exactly what was passed under Addendum 3 somewhere in this document, and in particular, and I know it's probably not even practical, um, but since the technical committee has said many, many times that, you know, the objective is to reduce mortality at all life stages, I wonder if the technical committee has talked about the potential of the management options that were adopted under Addendum 3 as to what they may provide, um, even if it's not quantitative, towards reducing uh, mortality at all life stages. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Do you want to respond, Kate? Um, I just did want to point out that on page two of the document, it does specify um, what the provisions were in Addendum 3. And um, if you'd like me to reiterate that paragraph later on in the document, I can work with you, Rob. Um, and also, the, um, the TC did look at some of the impact that the Addendum 3 regulations would have, specifically that the 9-inch the increasing the minimum size from 6 to 9 inches really only has the result of um, delaying mortality. They did note, though, that the pigmented eel tolerance um, might have a significant impact and they were interested to see how that um, would be implemented and what the effects of, of that requirement would be. All right, and Dan, I guess, you know, we'll follow up, Dan, and look and see if there's a better way to, uh, you know, uh, outline those options to recognize the linkages between them based upon some of the input unless we hear otherwise. Uh, I got Jim and then uh, Terry. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, that was a great presentation, Kate. That was a great summary because um, I was reading it half-heartedly the last few days, and it was got me right focused. So just actually two questions. Um, the first one has to do with, and it's just any of the quota options that we're talking about doing, is first off, 
Um, you know, the year 2010 was picked for the yellow wheel, for example, and essentially, um, but what is the confidence for each one of those? I can tell you right now in New York, uh, the confidence in that data is really low. So we're now going to embark on quota base on bad data, and but it's the best data we have. I understand that. So, but. So that's question number one, is if we could really get a, a sense of what the confidence level was in these those data sets, whatever, because some of the states um, have very good, you know, programs for catching their landings. Other states are working on them, which is us right now, but they're pretty poor, and then other ones may not be improving. So that's question one, if we could somehow put some confidence level as well, how good the data is. But then secondly, and if you look at the distribution of this, we have a very disparate distribution again. So here we go again. We're going to give, I think Tom's going to be quiet on this, but he's going to get 50% of the fishery. And then how are we going to get out of that if we find out we improve our landings and then suddenly um, maybe some of the other states should be getting a higher landing? How are we not going to start another holy war in two years when we start getting better data? So, thank you. So in regards to the first question, Kate or Sheila, do you guys have any? I mean, you kind of did address it. This is the best option that we did have. This is the option. Um, the 2010 harvest data, you know, was vetted through our stock assessment process. So if we're going to have a confidence in any of the data, this would be, you know, the, the best data that we, we could use um, versus data that was um, outside of the stock assessment process. Um, but certainly the board would have the ability to revisit allocation um, down the line if they, if they ch so choose to do so through an addendum process. Thanks. I got Terry and then Russ. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. My comment was specific to the thread that Dan initiated in your summary. Resolve that. Thank you. Thank you. Russ? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to get back to Jim's question about using the 2010 data, that really strikes me as uh, unfavorable for New Jersey fishermen, uh, considering that was our lowest year of landings since 2003. Um, as you all know, why our effort has been down in New Jersey because of the lack of horseshoe crabs for bait, so um, it kind of puts us in a little bit of a damper uh, there. Um, and it takes me back to when we had the working group and we made recommend recommendations back last August uh, to this board, and we recommended that we use uh, allocation to be based on average of the three highest landings from 2002 and 2012. Um, I don't see too many of the working group recommendations in here, and I, I find that kind of misleading to everybody who's been involved with that, that, that working group. Um, I wasn't going to bring this up until we actually started talking about the quota, but um, I just feel that this version, this iteration of this addendum is, is much different than the addendum three, uh, where the, the options were a lot different and, and a lot different from what the working group recommended. So I'm kind of having a hard time looking at this and saying, okay, we picked 2010 because it's the last year of the uh, assessment, and it kind of gets rid of all the historical perspective of the fishery itself, which was a little bit different five years before that. So I'm, I'm kind of distraught on that issue. I don't want to slow down the process, but to me, and I don't, I don't get too upset about these things too often, this was really a disservice to... Uh, New Jersey on, on one hand, but and probably some other states when they really go and look at it. And other states profited from that, and that's kind of disturbing. Thank you. Yeah, so um, just to, I guess, maybe add a little comment to that is, you know, one of the things that we observed in the, in the Denim 3 was there was a great disparity and the impacts to the states, and this, and this, these options were intended to uh, kind of address some of that disparity. Um, you know, I think I would, I would comment, Russ, is that if you feel like there's options that were um, previously presented to the board that are viable options, that we can add them to this addendum and take them out to public comment. All right. I got Lewis. Yeah, just a couple of questions. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure where we are in the deliberation, but. Just a couple of maybe clarifying questions. Um, three. First, Elver IDs. How do we know that the Elvers that we're catching are 
Are we doing? Uh, do we have a good cross section of IDs, and we know they're not Myrophis or some other elver that's coming in, or especially when you start looking at the little bit larger eels, are we confident in our IDs? Second, with the um, option seven, the aquaculture quota, I just want to make sure that I'm clear that any opportunity for, for lack of a better example, the American eel farm to get involved in aquaculture of domestic eels would have to get quota from the existing glass eel quota that currently is held by Maine and South Carolina. Just making sure that that's the only option that's there. And then the final, really more of a suggestion, would be to strongly recommend that we remove uh, quota op under just option six and not have any provisions to roll over any underage of glacial quota. That flies in the face of many of the requests that we've made in the past around this board asking for rollover, and it's always been, the answer has always been, well, we're never going to allow an underage to roll over on a stock that's overfished. Yet we still don't allow rollovers on stocks that aren't overfished. And so there's a real disconnect in how we handle this, and I think until we have a very clear discussion on this, perhaps at the policy board on how we're going to do rollovers, if we got a stock that's being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act, I would strongly recommend we not allow quota under just to be rolled over. Thanks, Lewis. So just to, you asked the question, where are we on the process? I thought we'd we try to provide the board a little, limited amount of time to ask some clarified questions, which uh, these have been. And then we'll, you know, my suggestion is to take, uh, we got like four issues. We've got the glass eel fishery, yellow, silver, and then the sustainable fishery management plan to try to take them one by one and agree to what options we want to include or exclude. So saw some hands over here. Okay. Sorry, Pat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a follow-up to uh, Russ's comment, uh, he indicated that the working group um, had suggested some recommendation on averaging um, several years together. And were, the, were those years proven to be not reliable or doable, or was it just um, just put aside out of hand? I mean, he raised he raised a legitimate question, and he was appeared to be very sincere about it. It will affect us as it affects them in several other states. So, uh, what years were you talking about? If Mr. Chairman, you could ask Mr. Allen that and uh, find out what the responses from the technical committee would be helpful. No. You go ahead. Um, the the. The working group recommendations was presented to the board, and based on the board discussions from how they were directing the PDT, um, there was clear direction to go forward with some other options, implementing uh, kind of a maximum and a minimum um, allocation threshold for the states, which is how the option two allocations were developed, and then working with uh, commission volunteers, this is how the weighted option um, reduction, or the, the weighted option quota um, allocations were included included in the document, which kind of takes into some of the strategies that was included in from the working group discussions. But overall, the if you, you look at the amount of coastwide quota, they typically all range from about a million to somewhere around 700,000 um, pounds from the working group discussions, from the previous addendum three options, and the ones included in here are you know 980,000 pounds to about 780,000 um, pounds. So they all kind of fall in that range. It's really just this, this allocation um, issue that there are many ways to look at it, which is why the commission volunteers who, who helped with um, this addendum requested that the mortality or catch cap be included as an option as well to get around that issue. A quick follow-on, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Pat. <clears throat> it was a good answer, Kate, but I, you lost me somewhere in there. I'm still, I'm still not, well, I'm not comfortable with <clears throat> that, that the option that they put forth or the suggestion they put forth Either it was not clear enough to the board when we passed judgment on it and said, throw it out, we don't want that, let's go another way. Uh, but I happened to take a quick look down that way, and, and the gentleman to my left was like, whoa, his eyes got big and his eyes, the glass almost fell off his head. So I, I, I'm not sure um, the answer was the one that would satisfy him, let alone me, because it's still not clear. If a three-year average of the three highest years would be more appropriate across the board. And we saw it as an example, as we did here, 
um, it would seem to satisfy not only my my quest for information, but probably it would clarify it in the public's mind also. Because I see us going down exactly the same place we went with summer flounder. And if we end up with any form of quota share, there are going to be winners and losers one more time. We did it with Manhattan. Uh, one state ends up with 85%. Others of us have to beg for transfer of quota. So I really think to base this whole approach on one year of data uh, to establish a quota is it just it's not acceptable. And then the follow-on would be with uh, Dr. Daniel who suggested something about option six, and I think I'm also opposed to the same thing he was opposed to, and when he's ready to make a motion on that, he'd be more than willing to ex offer a second to that section. All right, Thank Pat, you. Kate's going to provide a follow-up on this. So just for clarification, the um, total coastwide quota was based on the 2010 harvest level of 978,000 um, pounds, but the allocation options was based on the average um, landings in each state from uh, 2004 to 2013. And so we looked at how much um, each state landed during that time period and then applied that to the coastwide harvest um, of the 2010 um, harvest landings. And, and also just for reference, um, the public and the board has deliberated and considered and discussed um, other quota options in Addendum 3, and that was using the average from 1980 to 2011, um, 1990 to 2011, and 2000 to 2011. So there were three options plus reductions of 20, uh, 30, 40, and 50 percent from those base years that the board has already um, looked at. And again, those quotas uh, ranged from um, a million and a half pounds to 600,000 pounds. Thank you. It satisfies my need. I think I have to pass it off. I got David, Rob, and Mitch, but Russ, do you want to comment on this while we're on it still? Yeah, at the top of page 16, it says these uh, the allocations are based on 2011 to 2013 landings, not 2004 to 2012. And that's what kind of thrown me. So. Um, I'm sorry, that's my mistake. That was the, the glass hills was 2004 to 2013. You're right. It's 2011 to 2013s, different base years for the the two different fisheries. All right, we'll keep going around. If you guys want to add something to the uh, draft addendum, this is the opportunity today. I'm going to David and then Rob. Okay, yeah, I have a couple motions relative to glass seal. 3.1.1, uh, which I think staff have, and I might take them in opposite order from which I gave them, but once they get it up. Uh, one of the things that seems to be missing the addendum is an opportunity for, for states that don't currently have a glass eel fishery to, to uh, enter into one. Uh, there is the sustainable fishery concept, but it's rather complex. I don't think it fits, uh, you know, the it's crafted or modeled after the anadromous uh, fisheries plans for alewives, bluebacks, American shad, but the catadromous eel, I don't, I don't think it fits that model well because the whole concept of sustainable fishery management for a state is that if you enhance spawning in your waters, you'll enhance recruitment, which will return to your waters, and you don't have that concept for the contadromous fish. So do you have the motions that I provided that you could put up? Uh, and so um, uh, all right, I'll deal with this one first, but it, do it as two different motions then. So I'd like to add um, a new option uh, under the glass eel quota um, based on enhanced passage initiated after January 1, 2013. So under this option, states may earn glass eel quota via stock enhancement programs that increase glass eel passage. Um, so uh, in other words, if you, if you remove a dam or you provide passage over an obstruction and can quantify the number of uh, glass seals that then are able to continue their life cycle, 
uh, that some fraction of those, and I provided a series, a range of alternatives from 5 to 25 percent in 5 percent increments. Um, there it is. Um, that you would be able to harvest that, that portion. And in my thinking, given the value of this resource, states could then use the revenue that could potentially be generated from licensing of such activity and reinvest it in further enhancement programs. So that's my motion, if I can get a second. You got it. Okay, Pat Augustine is a second. You need me to read it, Joe? Move to add a new option. Glass EO quota based on enhanced passage initiated after January 1, 2013. Under this option, states may earn glass EO quota via stock enhancement programs that increase glass EO passage. The amount of quota earned shall not exceed an amount equal to sub option 1, 5 percent, and comma, 2, 10 percent, 3, 25 percent of the enhanced glass EO passage. Motion by Mr. Simpson, seconded by Mr. Augustine. Discussion on the motion? Kate asked if this would require TC review, David. I don't think so. I think when, when a state um, develops their uh, a proposal under this alternative, if it's passed, uh, there'll be a discussion about what, what the technical requirements are of estimating the number of additional glass eels that now get to survive to the next life stage. Uh, but to burden the addendum with all of what you saw in this sustainable fishery plan I think is too much now and, and frankly is, is so burdensome that, I mean, they're asking for things that the stock assessment couldn't provide, so it, it's kind of dead in the water. Uh, so I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to get some public comment on, on the concept and then um, hopefully work out through, um, if, if it's successful, through individual applications for um, glass eel quota down the road. Okay, thanks, David. Got some hands coming up now. Let's see. Terry? Yeah, thanks for the motion, Dave. Just Is, is, is your intent that this will be in lieu of Section 3.1.4 or in addition to? And that's the uh, state-specific sustainable fishery management plans. Uh, that's sort of the board's prerogative. I, I didn't see the sustainable plan being workable. I thought this was a cleaner, more understandable alternative, but I'd, I'd kind of like to hear the rest of the board's thoughts on that. All right, I got Pat. You in favor or support of it? Go ahead. Um, it, it, it was, is it your intent, Dave, to be specific to only states to establish new fisheries or for a No, it would not. It would be in any any state, whether they have a fishery now or not. If they make that investment in enhanced passage, then then they're you know earning some additional um, fishery uh, potential. Go ahead, Pat. I think on the same line that, that Terry was going, and based on your comments, um, I, I'm very uncomfortable with the the language for the state-specific fisheries management plan similar to we have with uh, river herring. I think you, you've made some really good points. My, my only druthers is um, I'm also very concerned, as you might imagine, with the aquaculture language that is in place. And this may be a good place to think about a friendly amendment to add language that would deal with state-specific changes to, in, to be able to access product or glass eels for, for state aquaculture. Okay, John, you in favor of support, in favor or oppose? Oh, again, I just had a couple of Go questions ahead. to the glass eel passages. I'm sorry if I missed it. Did that, Dave, does that include just like an eel ladder to allow glass eel passage? Yeah, any kind of uh, stock enhancement that allows the eel to continue its life cycle. And then would the quota that you get just be applicable to that, that water basin that you're allowing the passage on? No, I think it might actually be more effective if, if uh, it could happen there, but it might be more effective if it happened in another system that was dead-ended. So the glass eels in another area that are banging their head against a, a dam and are, are, are doomed, that might be the place to have that, that fishery. All right, I got Bob, and then I thought there was a hand up. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dave, is I'm trying to understand the intent here. It, it strikes me that it may be your intent to essentially establish a baseline and then allow harvesting on the surplus above that baseline. Is that indeed your intent? Would In order for this option to be exercised, would a state first have to establish what the current uh, eel uh, passage uh, uh, metric is and then be able to show that through the stock enhancement enhancement program that the state has enacted there has been an actual measurable increase in glacial movement is that your intent with this thank you no I think that that again reaches the the level of, of so burdensome you, you couldn't uh, achieve it but the idea of a, a, a an eel passage uh, a particular project where you could you could sample the you know the the success of that passage the number of eels passing over that provide a good estimate of it and you would get five to twenty five percent of that incremental increase so you're not burdened with trying to figure out throughout your entire state what what your um, you know glass eel numbers are from year to year because they're that's sort of the whims of nature anyway. Thanks, we got Ross, and then Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just for clarification, you use the term earned quota. Earned quota. I, I'm assuming you intend this to be additional quota on top of the proposed. How about now? There we go. Now, if I can remember what I was saying. <laughs> uh, you, you, your, your amendment speaks to earned quota. I, I assume that you, you intend this to be additional quota on top of whatever the proposed quota may have been for the, for the coastwide glass seal fishery. So it's not a reallocation of that existing quota. It would be additional quota on top of that. That's right. Okay, got Lewis. I, I kind of support the, the concept here, but I think there's some pretty sticky problems. Um, one, I go back to one of the original amendments where we had put in a placeholder for a glass seal interest, and that doesn't seem to hold a lot of water. I wonder how much this will. But then the other thing that really concerns me is knowing that there might be a lot of public money involved in creating these passageways and then indicating for the intent of passing eels and then for a regulatory body like this to give those eels away um, to a commercial enterprise is going to create some major political nightmares for us if we move forward with this. I got Pat and then Dennis and we have an hour to 345. I did get a couple minutes credit there, I think. Uh, just uh, just another very quick question. Um, so this is to increase upstream passage. What about downstream passage? Well, if it leads, you know, to a dead end, it's not enhancing the stock. So, uh, you know, uh, I guess I guess it's expected in any uh, diadromous stock enhancement program if, if the accommodation isn't there for downstream passage, um, it doesn't ultimately um, benefit the stock. Um, on, on the flip side, I suppose if, um, if you knew that and as a state you were investing money anyway in passage so that you could provide eel biomass to a, to a system, even if it didn't ultimately help the, the you know the northwestern hemisphere stock. There might still be a reason for a state to do it, and and no harm to the to the coastwide stock. Uh, Dennis, and then Mitch. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I like this motion, but I'm not sure that I really do. Because I can just see in the future, if this was implemented, that there would be a lot of mathematics and manipulations in how you calculate every, everything to allow yourself some quota. I think a simpler thing in my mind is to go back and not go back in time, but simply look at where we are. Years ago, we allowed the state of Maine and the state of South Carolina to harvest glass eels. I don't think that this board is bound by the actions of what was done in the past. We're in the year 2014, and if this board chooses to change things, I think that every state should be entitled to some amount of quota by their action. And the more I think about this, the more I think that we should be moving in that direction versus states doing things to earn what probably should be theirs, or some part of it should be theirs. We essentially right now are using a coastwide quota, which is Maine's quota. Whatever Maine's taking is essentially a proxy for a coastwide quota. And I just don't see as we move forward that we disadvantage states like North Carolina who would like the ability to harvest some amount of glass seals for an aquaculture project. They should have that opportunity and it shouldn't be restricted to one or two of the states that represent 15 along the Atlantic coast. That's my speech for the day. Thanks, Dennis. And uh, before I go to Mitch, uh, you know, if the, if the board wants the perspective of the technical committee person, we can ask Sheila for the, her input as well, all right? So, Mitch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I actually want to build a little bit on the previous point and a point that uh, Richie made this morning. Um, it was very clear at our last meeting that we asked the technical committee to please uh, embark on some watershed analysis in order to uh, and to, to offer some options or to at least give some uh, guidance on the question of what what is the potential uh, productivity of the watersheds in the different states and the reason that the board had asked the technical committee to do this was precisely because of the concerns Dennis just raised. We, as fish managers, we know that any watershed uh, can sustain a certain amount of harvest, and the fact that one state in the past has harvested glass eels and the fact that another state has harvested no glass eels really doesn't set, form the basis of sound science. We should be setting, if there's going to be glass eel quotas and if there's going to be a coastwide glass eel fishery, then first and foremost we should we should make sure that the allowable harvest in any state and in any watershed is sustainable based on the dynamics of that watershed. When I had made that, when I was just one of several people who asked the TC to uh, embark on that analysis, because according to a table four that has been handed out to us, basically six states are being told under the current options, notwithstanding the one that's on the motion that's on the board. But before this motion came up, we basically have an addendum that precludes six states from ever having any glass eel fishery simply because they didn't have significant adult eel fisheries in the past. Um, shutting those states out of the process seems to me not the kind of thing that could ever gain public uh, support. What could gain public support is if the technical committee would come back and say that Massachusetts, the watersheds in Massachusetts comprise 10 percent of the watersheds in North America, in the United States, therefore as a target for a quota setting, they would be entitled to 10 percent of the quota. If it turns out that Maine comprises 25 percent of the available freshwater habitat uh, for the species, then logically they would have 25 percent of the quota. Now, that was only proposed as an option. I'm not saying that's the only way to go, but I'm very disappointed that the, uh, the plan development team basically glossed over the issue or kicked the can down the road to the future. And we know that there's some very complex and, but nonetheless accessible mapping 
from both the Fish and Wildlife Service and some of the other federal agencies, we can, we can put together a document and the technical committee can review a document that gives this board at least a starting point as to what is the watersheds that are available in the different states. And I don't see how we can go to the public and suggest that states may be entitled to open up a glass eel fishery in the future but six of them can't because they didn't have adult eel fisheries in the past. That's not conservation. That's not science-based fishery management. That's just simply relying on history and politics to make decisions. And uh, I, for one, if I lived in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, South Carolina, or Georgia, I'd be really troubled by this approach. Um, and if I lived in Maryland, I guess I'd be real happy with it. Thank you. I got two people signed up, and uh, I think we've had a lot of discussion on this issue that after the next couple of comments, we should uh, consider voting it up or down. All right, we got Bill and then David. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in keeping with uh, the the idea of uh, that uh, Pat brought up about is it up, up river, down river, in river, or where river, uh, I, I also have a problem with uh, the wording where it says. Uh, because they did stock enhancement programs, they could get an increase. Who determines that, yes, you've got a stock enhancement, yeah, you, you get some? It, who, who Would it, it be the board that uh, a state would come and say, I did this, 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 and this, and we, we would be the determining factor that, uh, yeah, you did it, so we're going to give you more quota or whatever comes down? Who, who determines that? I guess that's the question. How about David address that? Yeah, sure. They, uh, the state would develop a proposal, uh, make it make a case. It would be reviewed by the technical committee and approved or disapproved by the board. Uh, so, if Connecticut did an eel passage um, project, uh, did some monitoring to um, calculate the the passage that was achieved, which you would do in any kind of project to see if it worked. That would be your basis. You'd make your case, and, and it would be voted up or down by this body. And, you know, I, I just want to, uh, part of my point is I, I, you know, I represent one of those states that has no alternatives under this plan, um, under this addendum for a glass eel fishery. So uh, this was one approach that I thought was viable that takes, um, that sort of creates new productivity and uses a small fraction of it to, to provide a fishery and I do have a follow-up motion just for those who have made the comment that that would provide um, some minimal amount of, of allocation of glass seal to every state um, it would be a little bit of a reallocation but it's you know uh, you know I'll just telegraph it a hundred pounds per state as a concept uh, so that um, yeah the, that that um, the history-based allocation that's burned many of us in the past doesn't burn us in the future. That there, there isn't a punishment for being conservative and a, and a reward for being more aggressive in terms of fisheries. So this is one of the ideas and the others a follow-up. So I, I hope people will support it. Thanks, Dave. And just to clarify, it, it was asked earlier whether the TC would review these, and I think the answer was no, but it sounds like, uh, maybe it was just a misunderstanding of the question, but it sounds like the intent of this is to have the TC review it and then the board take final approval. Okay, she's seeing nodding heads. So you guys uh, ready to have a 30-second caucus? All righty. Let's take the vote here. Joe, you good with the motion? It hasn't changed? All right. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. All those opposed, please raise your right hand. Null votes. Any abstentions? Got two uh, two abstentions. Motion carries. Dave, you have another motion you mentioned? I did have uh, one follow-up motion. If Melissa, whoever's running the program, can get to it.
And just uh, while we're waiting for this motion to be put on the, on the screen, um, as it was mentioned earlier, it's uh, difficult for the public to absorb a large suite of options. We want this addendum to be comprehensive, but we also should be looking at if there's any options that the board feels is not acceptable at this time. Um, let's, as David goes forward with this next motion, let's stick with glass seals and try to work through that and then move it forward with the yellow eel options. Okay, Dave, I think you're ready. Oops, okay. Yeah, um, so this is the, the follow-up, and this would be um, under option four, which is glass seal quota based on landings. I think we need, you know, broaden that a little bit um, so that uh, to add a sub-option that sets a minimum glass seal quota of 100 pounds per state. And I simply modeled this after the yellow wheel idea that, you know, no state should get less than 2,000 pounds, which I thought was, was a pretty decent, smart thing to do. So, um, um, so that's my motion. I hope um, I can get a seconder. Second of our discussion purposes, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Pat. Um, follow up to that. Um, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, because we've questioned the actual status of the stock, uh, whether or not this throws a wrinkle in the whole process. I mean, we've, we've talked about uh, not knowing exactly what the glass eel population is. We've questioned uh, the report. That hey, Pat, oh. let, me, let me just get a second on the motion before we get a discussion going, all right? Did you second it, Pat? I'm sorry. I didn't even see that. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, I did it fast so you wouldn't be able to stop me. <laughs> uh, no, as I, as I said, I, I seconded it for discussion purposes because of the technical report saying that they weren't comfortable with the uh, Glacier report and the status of the stock. And on the other hand, as I was going to continue, it does give every state at least something to work with. If you do not have a glass hill fishery now, um, as you go forward in developing these passages as a follow-on to the previous motion that Mr. Simpson made, it only seems logical uh, that this may in fact um, ask, uh, suggest to some of those states that they should try to enhance their passages and, and help the, the overall population. Thanks, Pat. I got Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question, Dave. Would this be transferable to another state? Yeah, I think um, that's in another part of the addendum, but I would anticipate it's uh, transferable. And to clarify Pat's question, this would not be adding glass seal harvest. This would, in effect, be reallocation. So it will, whatever the total number of pounds we set as a coastwide cap on glass seal harvest, each state would get a minimum of 100 pounds the balance of it would go to the states that have existing quotas and the proportion that they historically have. All right, Kate's got a question. Uh, just for clarification, you mentioned um, transferability was looked at in the document, but that was for the yellow eel fishery. So would you like transferability under this option? It seems like you would. Yes. Okay, and also would there be any other um, enforcement or penalty or monitoring requirements that would go along with um, the 100 pound quota. I think all of those uh, are necessary in this fishery in particular. And part of the logic is that it, you know all of our agencies are 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 saddled with some level of enforcement burden in this fishery because it exists. And I think even if we closed, we'll still have an enforcement burden. So again, um, you know th this would at least provide some level of fishery to sort of balance off the the cost of enforcement that we're going to have anyway. Okay, I got David. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I I like the concept here, but uh, um, I'm a little apprehensive about simply picking a hundred pounds. Uh, and I I can kind of align my thinking with a lot of the speakers, probably four or five speakers before this, that all pointed out we really need some kind of more objective way of allocating a glass eel. Uh, uh, fishery, and I, I just remind everybody: a lot of states, Rhode Island fell into this category. <clears throat> excuse me, adopted uh, a minimum size uh, on eels uh, when the initial threat 
uh, of a developing fishery came out. So we acted proactively and essentially prohibited uh, a, a glass yield fishery. A number of the uh, other New England states in New England did that, and I think a number of, of states in the Mid Atlantic uh, did that. You know, the Commission has a long standing position of not penalizing states. Uh, for acting in that manner, and I think what we really need to do is, <clears throat> excuse me, is to uh, remand this back to the technical committee and ask them to come up with a with another set of allocation uh, uh, formulas that uh, would be based on watershed or some other criteria uh, that kind of address the equity issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Assuming this one comes up for a vote, I'm going to vote against it. Uh, using the same rationale I did over the previous vote, uh, a number of years ago um, we had an enforcement nightmare in our state when there was a glass eel fishery. And it took a number of years to get it regulated and get it outlawed. And uh, I think this is a step back and causes us, the public, to wonder what justification we had, say, 15 years ago in closing the glass eel fishery when now we're proposing that it's going to open, while at the same time we're saying the species is depleted and in need of additional management. I don't see where this is going in any direction other than additional harvest, and I'm going to pose it for that reason. Thank you. Thanks, Roy. Lewis? Yeah, if that were the reason, I would too, Roy. Um, you know, back in... August, I guess, when American Neal Farm first came, and we were all intrigued about the potential for domestic domestic aquaculture and have some product harvested here in the U.S., processed here in the U.S., consumed here in the U.S., and I think everybody, for the most part, agreed with that concept. And a lot of things happened between last August and now, where we're still sort of where we were last August. But... It was, it's been my intent, and I think the intent of at least a few members of the board, you know, that we would like to see some domestic aquaculture move forward if there's, if there's viability there, if it can work. Um, you know, I like the concept of the motion of getting everybody's foot in the door, but I know what the result will be is some states are going to just go out and try to harvest 100 pounds at 800, 1,000, however much a pound. And that really defeats the purpose. I think if we're going to allow any glass eel harvest above and beyond what we currently allow, it should be for bona fide brick and mortar aquaculture facilities to, to test that model, to test that case that we all seem to be pretty intrigued with about nine months ago. Thanks, Lewis. Pat? Um, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I was wondering why Mr. Abbott was being so um, supportive of Maine this morning. Now I know because he wants to go to a state quota, a uh, state by state quota system, and take it all away from us. So. Um, um, <laughs> I, I do have, I think what, what Mr. Borden said, Dave Borden said, um, does ring true to me. There's, there is an arbitrary nature to this, just going by 100 pounds per state, and I think having the technical committee look at this a little bit differently to try to create some rationale may be a better approach. I mean, the, I'm, the, the concept isn't bad, but and I think the idea of having some some th something set aside for aquaculture in a state is not that bad. Whether this is what it would get to is another question, but I, I think the TC doing a little additional work here wouldn't be bad, and I think I'm going to have to vote against this. Thanks, Pat. Mitch? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Briefly, I would point out to my fellow commissioners that at the American Fishery Society Symposium on Eels that's going to take place in mid-August, one of the presentations is going to be from a group of French scientists that are going to address the very question of how to establish a TAC for glass eels. 
I think that this is going to prove very helpful to a lot of these questions. There's going to be a lot of information presented at that Quebec Symposium. I really encourage everyone to just spend five minutes on the web, pull up the uh, agenda for that symposium, and you'll see how much really interesting information is going to be presented. But I, I echo the comments of the last few speakers that uh, we do need to at least take some initial steps to create objective standards by which quotas are set. Uh, especially if we're going to expand the fishery into other states. Thank you. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, the Technical Committee has been referenced a couple times if, as, uh, if they've looked into this before. Or, so I'm going to give a minute to Sheila to provide any perspective from her committee. Um, thank you. Yes, the Technical Committee has discussed this to some degree. Uh, part of it comes out with the sustainable fishing plans or that we have at the end of the document. Um, we have an idea of watershed sizes. We've looked at that for each jurisdiction, um, but we really didn't feel that the technical committee could come forward with a proposed quota by state for something like this. We really felt that that had to be coming from the board. Thanks, Sheila. So you guys, uh, I got, I've gone through everybody on the list. Um, any last minute questions? David? Yeah, uh, I'll just say that um, you know the, the idea of a, an objective criteria, an objective criteria for fair allocation of resources has been a, an elusive goal to the commission. Uh, you know, think about summer flounder. So, I mean, that's why I started with you know offered a very small entry level, get your feet wet. Uh, type of um, amount that doesn't gouge in, you know, a primary existing player or anyone else. Uh, some states won't won't participate, and that's that's expected. Others may want to. So, um, and again, I heard it said a couple of times, which is not accurate. This is not an additional harvest. This this does not add an additional glass eel to the mortality rolls. This is this is a real reallocation. And, and if it passes, I, well, I'll just leave it at that. All right. I think we've had a good discussion on it. Um, let's take a 30-second caucus. And uh, you have a quick, quick comment, Craig? Yeah, it's not a, not a comment, just a quick clarifying question. Did I understand Sheila to say that the TC was looking for the board to make a decision when it came to setting this threshold? Yes, we suggested that there be a quota, but as far as allocation goes between the states, the TC did not want to weigh in on that. Thank you. All right, 30 second caucus, guys. All righty. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. All opposed, please raise your right hand. Any thank you. Any null votes? Any abstentions? Got two. Three. three. Motion fails, right? Motion fails six nine. Motion fails six nine zero three. So um, sticking with glass seals, there's ten options currently in the plan. Um, I suggest we kind of get focused right on those and uh, see if there's any that we want to remove at this point in time. See Terry? And, uh... Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I can generally support the wide range of alternatives and, and, and thank the, uh, the uh, PDT for all the work that, and I know it's a bucket load of work that they did in, in, since, since our winter meeting. However, with the one exception of, of, alter, of, of option seven, the aquaculture quota, Dave's first motion um, uh, I think was a good motion. I'm not sure whether we're going to go, uh, what the board's going to do if we, if we put the, uh, the, the section 3.1.1 uh, ahead. If we do put it ahead for public comment, whether or not it will in fact um, um, be supported in the final action. But um, before lunch, I asked Sheila if the TC considered additional alternatives for for, for um, uh, aquaculture quota, and she referred to that section. You know, Dave, Dave's offered us another approach. Um, I believe that either of these measures will allow for a more reasonable uh, development of, of aquaculture uh, opportunities, which, as Lewis said, um, I think the board generally supports. But both of those measures would be far less um, uh, punitive than 
to the Maine and South Carolina fisheries than, than, than I believe um, option seven is. So I'm going to make a motion to remove option seven from section 3.1.1 from the draft document. Got a second by David Borden. Let's get it up on the screen. Joe, you're going to need me to read it into the record? All right. We're gaining momentum, guys. Gaining momentum. All right, move to remove option seven, glass eel aquaculture from section 3.1.1 by Mr. Stockwell, second by Mr. Simpson. I'm sorry, it was, it was Borden? Sorry. <laughs> Who seconded the motion? All right, for the record, I corrected. The second was Mr. David Simpson. Thanks. All right, got Lewis. Yeah, I, th I think option seven says under this option, the board may choose to allocate a percentage of the total quota for approved aquaculture purposes. I think that's precisely what we've been wanting to do if given the opportunity, and this does that. If we take this out, we have no mechanism to do anything for the bona fide brick and mortar aquaculture facilities. So I don't, I don't think there's anything sacrosanct or lifelong about any quota allocation. Um, we'll probably find that out in, in multiple species we'll be dealing with over the next year. So I, I, would, I would speak strongly in opposition to the motion and ask the board to do the same. Thanks, Dave. You for, you for or against? All right, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the opportunity was just before the board, in my view, and, and was voted against. And so now I see this as instead of, you know, six or eight states getting 100 pounds, uh, that one state wants several hundred pounds, because I've only heard of one, um, you know, one state that's come forward with such a very specific use for this product. Uh, so, you know... Uh, I oppose it on that ground. All right, thank you. Uh, John, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a question. Um, does Would option eight, would states still be allowed to issue aquaculture permits, even if option seven is not in there for, such as what Lewis Daniel was talking about, to have a aquaculture operation in their states? I'm just a little confused between these two options. Um, that is correct, that the option A just would require that um, glass eel harvest for commercial uses for aquaculture would not occur under a scientific collection permit, but the state would be using that through an aquaculture permit process. I got Pat and then Doug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess this question is for Kate. Under the state-specific sustainable fisheries management plans, w was there any talk about because it's a state-by-state -state issue, utilizing uh, yellow eel quota or allocation to somehow convert into glass eels to, so you could keep this specifically within state as it relates to aquaculture? So under the plan, once um, the state assessed the mortality that was occurring, it would be able to allocate that mortality to any life stage that it wanted to. And then additionally, as I mentioned, there was a transfer plan in there so that if the state, if the board did approve a quota for the yellow eel fishery, it would be, um, the state would be able to come forward and um, transfer that yellow eel quota to a glass eel fishery or a silver eel fishery or for aquaculture or research purposes. So, Mr. Chairman, I think that would accomplish what a state might want to do then as far as, as, far as aquaculture within reallocating uh, quota for aquaculture for that state. That is one option. Yep. Doug? Kate, did you want to clarify? I just did want to remind the board that the states with the 2,000-pound quota would not be eligible for that. All right, Doug? 
Well, first of all, that was a point I was going to make to my uh, good friend, Pat Keller, Commissioner Kelleher's point. Um, I, I look at this as an option that should be in there to uh, be taken out to public hearing. Uh, I'm not sure how I'd feel one way or the other about it, but I think it'd be pretty important to uh, get public comment on this because aquaculture is something that I think has, has been stated uh, this board has, uh, has shown a support for. Uh, domestic aquaculture programs, and this this might be a way of doing it. There may be other ways. I think the motion that was put forward by uh, David Simpson, you know, also helps at, get at that. Uh, but <clears throat> we've got to wait until we get our uh, uh, our um, eel passage projects in place, and that may take us some time. This would be a way that the board could. Uh, address the aquaculture needs on a quicker basis. So I hope we keep this in there for just for the for the public hearing. Thanks, Doug. That's everybody on the list. Let's take a 30-second caucus and then vote on the motion. All righty. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. All those opposed, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Any no votes? Abstentions? Thank you. Motion uh, fails. Two fifteen zero two. Lewis. Yeah, if you're, hey, Lewis. This, yeah, I had Doug on the, my list from last time. Okay. You're next. All right, after Doug. That's fine. Thank you. Go ahead, Doug. Well, again, thank you. I had a modification that I wanted to make to one of the uh, options. It's sub-option 5B, the quota overage tolerance, where um, we'd essentially wouldn't count anything above 5% overage. Um, I have uh, a lot of problems with that from a stock that's depleted. Uh, I think so. What I would like to do is insert make a motion that would um, say that up to, let me get my motion, a tolerance of up to 5% overage would be allowed without payback if the current stock status is not overfished. And if I can get a second to that. I'll provide my justification. Now, Doug, just, I mean, the stock's currently uh, condition is uh, depleted, not overfished, so. Correct. So what I'm tying this measure to is a future stock assessment that would uh, say that this, our stocks are not, our eel stock is not overfished. Now, let's see. See if, it, see if it's second on the motion, then we'll have discussion. If it was second on the motion, let me get it written first. Let's get it on the screen. So, and while we get on the screen, Doug, um, Kay was just saying the current stock status is not classified as overfished, so this would be an allowable. That's clear. All right, so we have moved to insert, insert in option 5, section 3.1.1, option 5, sub-option B, a tolerance of up to 5% overage would be allowed if the current stock status is not overfished. And because Follow of up, Kate's clarification, I would say not depleted or overfished. My point is to get to the point where we have a stock that is, is uh, not overfished anymore or not depleted. Stock that's in good shape. Does everything else look good on the motion, Doug? I'll read it for the record. If you get a second, Joe, Do you have a second on the motion. Got Rick Bellavance. Move to insert in section 3.1.1, option five, sub, sub option B, a tolerance of up to five percent overage would be allowed if the current stock status is not depleted or overfished. By uh, Mr. Doug Grouch, second by Mr. Bellavance. Discussion on the motion. Now, Lewis. Uh, again, back to my comment, and I want to I want to do something on option six. 
at some point, but we don't allow this for summer flounder. We don't allow tolerance of over the quota for anything else I'm aware of. Maybe we do, but I'm not sure why eels are so special. I don't think they are very special compared to some of the other. No, not bluegills. Don't. <laughs> God, I didn't say that again. <laughs> but, I mean, if we're going to allow 5% overage on our quotas, let's allow it for stocks that aren't overfished and be consistent. Thanks, Lewis. Any other comment? All right, 30 second caucus. Maybe 20 second. All right, we take a vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Got Pat from Maine, too. For all those opposed, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Any null votes? Abstentions? Motion fails. Lewis. Yeah, for the, same, for the same reason I mentioned earlier on in the question section, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we remove option six, quota over underages from the document. Seconded by Dennis Abbott. So remove option six under the glass seal section. Uh, Dennis Abbott. Go ahead, David. I wonder if Lewis would want to amend his own motion to um, strike sub-option uh, sub option 5B for the reasons he stated before and not have a tolerance. Is that seem to be what you wanted to do? You didn't want to leave a, a tolerance in there? Yeah, I don't want any tolerance. Right. Um, and on an overfish depleted stock, for sure. And then I think down the road, maybe in other plans, we can. I think I think the policy board really needs to discuss this so that we're consistent in all our plans, and have a have a guideline on how we deal with underages and tolerances for stocks that are not over, that are overfished, overfishing occurring, any of those kinds of things. And then I think if we're gonna if we're gonna allow rollovers or tolerances for stocks that aren't overfished and overfishing is not occurring, then I think we need to allow it for all of them and not pick and choose. So I'd be glad to friendly amend that motion to also remove 5B, um, which is similar to the to the option 6 motion if, if that's okay with my seconder. Uh, Dennis DeShaka said he's agreeable to it. I'll read it for you in a second, Joe. While we're waiting, other people want to speak on the motion? Show me by a sign of hand. Doug? I'd like to third that motion. <laughs> All right, we got move to remove option 5B, quota overages. Hold on. All right, Joe. Move to remove option 5B, quota overage tolerance and 6 under section 3.1.1, quota underages. Motion by Mr. Daniel, second by Mr. Abbott. We had a brief discussion. Let's have a 30 second caucus. All right, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. All those opposed, please raise your right hand. Any null votes? Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. 
All right, we're getting there. Any other changes to the options that are currently in and discussed today for the glass eel fishery? Got it, Richie? I, I don't have a, an addition uh, or a change, but I was hoping uh, Dave Borden would, because I thought he was close to <laughs> coming up uh, with some language uh, that could go back to the PDT. Uh, to address this issue, which seemed to have a fair amount of support on the board of some way of figuring out a way in which other states have some uh, access to some quota. So, David, I hope you can come up with something. My cohort to my left, I think, is working on a motion. <laughs> Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I would um, move to request the technical committee to investigate a watershed-based allocation scheme for the glass eel fishery quota, and remove or uh, postpone all glass eel uh, deliberations until am Amendment 5, or is that Addendum 5? Addendum 5, and proceed with the yellow and silver eel options. All right, give us a minute to get that on the screen. You just take a look at it on the screen, Dan, as it gets written to make sure it's correct. Hey, Dan, how's it look? Yes, that's it. All right, do we have a second on the motion? Uh, Mr. Borden? Move to request the technical committee review a watershed-based allocation scheme for glass eel quota and postpone options to addendum 5 and proceed with yellow and silver eel options in addendum 4. Motion by... Dan McL uh, McLaren, I'm sorry, Dan. Dan McLaren, seconded by Mr. Borden. Da uh, you want to speak on the motion, David? Please, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I I concur with the sentiment here, but uh, I think uh, most of the members sitting around the table want to get on with this addendum. Uh, would like to move it along, and, and I'm just uh, trying to pick up on the thought that came up earlier. It seems like there's going to be a workshop in the next couple of months where a lot of these issues are going to get fleshed out. So rather than just separate this issue out, it seems to me what we need to do is simply uh, a task the TC with evaluating this They'll get back to us in a couple of months. We'll have the results of the workshop. We put it all into a one package and then send it out the door. <clears throat> that would be a slightly different strategy than what Dan put in the in the uh, motion. I, um, Sh Sheila wants to provide a little perspective to kind of manage the board's expectations on what they can do. Thank you. Um, the technical committee has looked at watershed sizes by state. We do have a list of the watersheds within a state and how large the watershed is. We do not have an idea right now of impediments in the watershed to know really what's accessible for eel habitat within that state. We also do not know what the historical range of eels was in each habitat. That's something that we're looking at for the ESA listing as well, and we do not have access to that information right now. So what we what we could provide with you provide to you is a list of basic drainage area for eels that is the potential for a state, but that's really all that we could do. And if you wanted to make a quota based on those numbers, that's all the technical committee is going to be able to get to you in the near future. Thanks. Uh, discussion the motion. We've got David, then Pat. Yeah, so uh, this is a question. Um, so what this would do is just maintain status quo for glass eel fisheries. There, there would be Maine's self-imposed quota, South Carolina, whatever they're doing, and we wouldn't change anything else. Is that what would happen if this motion passed, right? Getting different 
answers from the motion maker and the staff. So we need to clarify that. Kate? Well, it, it would remove the glacial options from the addendum, and so you know, it would just continue on with Maine and South Carolina implementing those measures um, as they are, and then at some point, if the glacial options were brought forth in addendum five, they would be addressed then. Go follow up, David. Yeah, so that would remove any possibility of the board considering lowering the overall removals from the popular, you know, fishing rate, all, all those things that they would, those opportunities would be foregone here. And I, I think we, we've already received the analysis from the technical committee on, on this, so. All right, I got, I got Dennis, who I promised to go to before you pass. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That, that's all right. I just think that these, there's two parts to this motion, and I don't really think they are related. And I don't know that we shouldn't. If, if we're going to vote on anything, we should divide the question and vote on the request about a watershed-based allocation scheme, and then make a vote about whether to proceed with the addendum with only yellow and silver reels. Okay, Pat Augustine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rather than divide the question, I suggest that we defeat this motion. Um, it's con counterproductive to what we're trying to accomplish today. We're trying to move this thing forward uh, to delay it for any period of time uh, other than wait for the conference results that are going to be coming along in a couple of months and burden the technical committee with any more effort. Uh, it, it just doesn't seem to make sense. So I would move to call the question, Mr. Chairman. Hope you all vote it, vote it down. Almost there. Got yeah, Pat? Uh, sorry, Joe. Um, if, I'll, I'll be happy to kind of hold a turn right here because uh, I have a motion that may get at what Dave Simpson put on the table in a way that kind of melds some things together. All right. You guys want a brief caucus? Lewis? Well, I just, I mean, that's, that's intriguing what Pat has said, but I think, you know, we have folks that are interested in the aquaculture aspects of this plan. I don't know how many. I know one that is very interested. And this provides an opportunity for the public to comment on this issue. Now we may come back after public comment and decide to do just that. But I think we, need, we owe it to the public and the folks that have been in, traveling to these meetings for the last year to at least get a sense of what the public thinks in regards to aquaculture and glass eels. All right. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. All those opposed, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Any null votes, abstentions? Motion fails. Pat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna, do we do we have the motion that Dave Simpson made earlier? That may, that may help bring a little clarity to this. But the conversations, um, um, Lance Stewart brought it up at several at the past winter meeting, and we've we've brought this up several times. And I believe I asked the TC the question regarding understanding that all habitats are not created equal and in within the state of Maine and I'm sure within all of the other states we definitely can uh, show that there are glacial runs where they are trying to move upstream into habitats that has no value um, for growing out eels uh, into other life stages. So if a state could demonstrate that why couldn't we allow the harvest up to a minimum, or you know, up to a minimum of 100 pounds, whatever the number is. Why couldn't we design, try to develop some language here that would allow that to happen? So a state would have to demonstrate to the technical committee that they are going to um, harvest from uh, low-value habitat that would not impact the overall abundance of eels coastwide. Um, So, Pat, what I'm thinking is, and it's up to the board, but it seems like that 
could potentially fall under the sustainable fisheries management plan section that we haven't got to yet and maybe as we work through these other issues everybody can give some thought to that and we can uh, see if the, if the board is interested in adding something like that to the uh, sustainable plan section or not. All right, we're still on glass eels. Is everybody comfortable with the uh, where we are on glass seal options for public comment? All right, let's move on to an even easier one, right? Yellow eels. All right, yellow eels, there's, um, I guess there's six options in there right now. Uh, let's try to focus on those that we want to remove or add. Got Rob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I can't quite say I've kept up with all the changes from last August with the various uh, tables that have been produced, but there is a comment in the uh, on page 18 under weighted yellow eel quota that says additionally the TC does not recommend implementing a coastwide quota above the 1998 to 2010 harvest and that is 907,671 pounds. So in looking at the past tables, which aren't in this document, I realize this, all of those were less than that amount. In looking at options two, the three options under two, um, really you have one that's under that amount, and that is 2C. When you look at the three options under um, quota options three or table five, uh, you do have one, two, uh, option 3B and option 3C that are less. So uh, so my comment is how important it is for us to go by that information of the technical committee of the 907,671 pounds and I'm not ready to excise an option 3 yet but I must say um, it's a big surprise when I saw that option the way the weighting is done, it relies heavily on the modern data um, because the 2011 to 2013 is 70%. And I'm just wondering, I want to hear from other uh, commission members as to how they find this. I'm mindful of what Russ Allen said earlier, which was the working group was looking at an average of 2002 to 2012. And in my case, what I remember is I had asked at a previous meeting if 2012 could be considered. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's right or wrong to have 2013 here. I hope all the commercial data is in and that there's confidence in that uh, because it's May and sometimes, you know, that still is a little bit of a problem. Uh, but overall, I'd like to hear more comments on option three. And then I realize even for option two, that has recent years as well. Yeah, and, and uh, just one comment. I think you know the technical committee was clear to reduce harvest across all life stages, and you know I'm and I don't know if she she was able to provide what that what that baseline period is, but you know we just identified some options in glass seals that allow that harvest to expand what it was prior to the last assessment as well. So it's something that the board's going to have to contend with as to what options are feasible to go out for public comment. John? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know from looking at this, and Tom's looked at it a lot, Rob, and it's just really difficult looking at the landings data to find a reference period that would have worked for all states. I think that was part of the impetus between, behind looking at the, uh, the weighted averages. I know from what Russ said and what Jim said, uh, our state has the same problem where we had some good years, but they were year, uh, several years back because of lack of bait. Um, I think when we look at the landings, the yellow wheel landings, that they've been fairly steady since about 1996. And that's one of the reasons I thought the catch cap would be the best idea because we wouldn't have to find a quota for each state and, and deal with that. Um, I also don't think that one thing that I would just like added to the addendum is under the discussion of the European eel fishery, there's talk about the precarious state of that fishery, the actions they've taken in Europe, and then it's put there that 
they still landed in 2012 over 5 million pounds of eels, Touché. whereas under the American eel fishery, it's not pointed out that uh, for the U.S. coast, we only landed about a million pounds of eels. You put Canada in in 2012, we were still just about 2 million pounds for the entire coast of North America from Canada all the way down to Florida. And I would just like that made more clear that by sticking with the 2010 uh, landings as the cap or the amount that we are working the quota from, we're not at a historically high level of catch or anything like that. I, I just would like that made a little more clear in the document. Thank you. Thanks, John. I got Mitch. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, John, for making that important point. That's, it's great to know that someone's really paying attention closely. Um, I don't mean to be overly critical, Kate, but I also would like to take exception and ask, you, ask the TC if it would please reconsider the statement that the status in Canada is showing dramatic declines over the entire range. I don't think there's any evidence of that at all. I don't disagree that there's been a dramatic decline in the upper St. Lawrence and Great Lakes region, but uh, I don't believe there's evidence of, I mean, of course the word dramatic is very subjective anyway, but uh, I do think that conveys a little bit of a misleading impression about the fishery. Um, I just want to also point out one last thing. The the reason that we're even talking about yellow eel measures again, if you recall, at the end of the process when we agreed to Addendum 3 and put it out to public comment and then voted on it, we didn't resolve glass eel issues at that time, and we asked the technical committee to go back and bring us glass eel options. What the technical committee did, in, when it wasn't a technical committee, it was the PDT. When the PDT met to talk about glacial options, and they understood that many states wanted to open up the possibility of future glacial fisheries, the PDT, early in their deliberations, had a vote or took the position that if you're ever going to convert to glacial fisheries, you then you need to start with a yellow eel quota. The concept being that any state's ability to expand into the glacial fishery should be premised on where they stand today in connection to the yellow eel fishery. Now, it seems to me from some of the some of the discussion that we've already had that the mood of the board is really to move to a more objective measure for um, assessing what should be the appropriate level of harvest of glass eels, uh, and it shouldn't be based on what was your historical yellow eel um, harvest. If we agree with that, why are we revisiting the issue of yellow eel quotas when, as John points out, we're basically fishing at historic low levels. Our fishery of yellow eels as is at or near historically low levels. Our stock assessment group says that our stocks are at historically low levels because they look at the catch data. That's what the model, the uh, depletion-based model did. It looked at what are your catches, it smoothed it out and then by putting in, conf you know, with confidence intervals and then said we're at a historically low level. So basically low, low population and low catch right now are just being considered synonymous. If we're at a historical level of low catch and low harvest, it seems like it's a fairly decent place for us to be. As John was kind enough to point out, we're, we're five times lower than where the traditional level of fishing in Europe was. I'm sorry, we're ten times lower in this country. Uh, John pointed out they're at five million pounds, but that's down from their historical levels, which were over ten million. So. If we're not, if we're going to move towards an objective basis for establishing glacial quota at some point in the future, then is it really necessary for us to go forward with uh, yellow wheel quotas at this time, when really there's only one state in the entire country that's harvesting anything even close to a significant amount of yellow eels? It's Maryland. There's not another state in this country that's harvesting significant numbers of yellow eels. We've did, we've reduced this fishery to one of the smallest fisheries managed by ASMFC and to keep going in that direction is, is really just we're getting to the point where we're just going to kill the fishery because it's not uh, there's not a critical mass there to cover the uh, the overhead of running a fishery thank you thanks Mitch and we do have staff's co-option in the addendum and just to defend staff a little bit uh, the statement 
commented earlier is directly from the DFO report on the status of the Canadian eel population. So right or wrong, that's the reference for that. Um, got Russ? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm kind of with Rob on this, trying to gauge you know everybody's thoughts, process before I make a motion. Um, I just want to hear what people have to say about going back to the working group recommendations. I don't want to add a whole other suite of options in there. Um, so as Rob said, if, if, if say, option three is, is removed from there, then, that, then it would be a good time to maybe put that in there. I'm just trying to gauge and, and try to get some feedback from the board before we do that and waste a half hour to an hour, which we don't have. So um, any opinions on that would be much appreciated. Go ahead, Walter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there's been a lot of discussion that the, the data, the, the catch data, isn't, isn't good enough to really. So I wonder if maybe there should be an option, not that I feel comfortable making this motion because this isn't that big of a fishery in Maine, but um, a motion to quantify cap and possibly reduce effort. Um, that seems to be more, since we don't have good landings data in a lot of states, that maybe it should be an effort management, at least for this for the time being. So when Walter Kay was asked to explain a little bit more, what I got from that was that rather than a quota, look at management options to quantify cap or reduce effort and, and go at it that way. Correct. All right. So if there's any ideas on on that front, that could be added to the um, draft addendum. Any other board input on the yellow eel options? Can I give an idea on uh, Marty. Go ahead. Uh, just to give an idea about the cats at the moment, uh, I don't know what the TC looked at for their uh, volume of eels at the moment. The, the, the actual effort data is way down, probably by 60%. Um, at the moment, the stock assessment, the way I see it, what we buy every week, is 60% small eels. The, the, you can get, get 50,000 pounds of small eels next week if you want to. Can't get, the big eels is very limited. Um, the weather has a lot to do with it this year. And of course, uh, you know, even North Carolina, the water has been very, very cold. So it's, a, it's in a very late stage of catching. So a lot of people go back to crabs, they don't stay on eels. Um, that's one of the parts I'd like to bring up that, you know, the stock of says for this year is a very, very rough year. But there's plenty of small eels, there's plenty of stock there. Thank you. All right, thanks, Marty. Uh, and Kate does have the, the working group uh, options that were put forth uh, previously, um, if the board wanted to examine that. In, um, you know, you do see some minor adjustments in some states. Um, go ahead, Russ. Well, for lack of getting any other information, I'll, I'll be willing to make a motion to uh, include the working group allocation recommendation from their August uh, memo to the board, which was based on the average of the three highest landing values from 2002 to 2012. And there is a table in that working group memo that, that has that. And that those uh, that inclusion is in for option two and three. So it gives you a whole other suite of options within there. I think, we're, I think we're going to try to bring them up on the screen just so people can take a look at. The options, the, the, the table that's in there isn't quite the same as the tables that are in the current addendum. Get the motion on the board and see if we get a second. Pat, you going to second it? <laughs> Got pulled back. Rob, you have a comment while we're waiting for the motion to be written? Yes, I just wanted to ask about the working group process. Was that to uh, further the information that we had previously um, through 2010? Because the three options from last August um, all concluded with 2010. So is that, was that the genesis of the working group to get started on that? Not being involved with the work group, I'm not certain. Anybody from the work group? No? Go ahead, Russ. The, the working group was put together because we couldn't come to any 
substantial dis decisions on anything at that point. And we met a few times in June and April, or June and July, and then uh, put this memorandum together that I believe was given to the board back in at the August meeting. So there were members of the board, there was technical committee members, and AP members that were all involved. All right, we got the motion. Let me read it. You good with it, Kate? All right. Move to include the working group allocation recommendation from their August memo to the board as an option to include the three highest landing years from 2003 to 2012 for options two and three. Motion by Mr. Allen, seconded by Mr. Augustine. Discussion on the motion? John? Well, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, those, that option was one that was favorable to Delaware as well as New Jersey. I understand that, but I know that uh, one of the problems we had, as I mentioned before, was that you don't want to just ignore what's been happening in recent years. And I know, Russ, you've got the same problem we do, which is that female horseshoe crabs, when is that ever going to become legal again to use as bait? You know, when, when are our eelers going to get that? I look at our landings and they dropped 40 percent between 2007 and 2008 when you couldn't get female horseshoe crabs anymore. And so that's the reason I don't really like any of these state-by-state -state quotas is because um, you just can't find an allocation that really works for all the states. Thanks. Russ? Yeah, I, I agree with you on some points there, John, for sure. I still, I, we still have the 2010 base landings in the tables themselves in addendum two and three. It's just the allocation that changes because um, the allocation was based on 2011 to 2013, which, you know, back at that time you were on the working group and we all decided that we needed. Okay. Like I said, my point was just that I don't think, based on landings data, that we can get a really fair allocation that, you know, I mean, I don't think Maryland should be penalized for the fact that they've been the state that's been able to take bigger harvests lately. That's why I thought a cap would be kind of the way to do it, although I know a cap has plenty of problems also, but I just don't see a fair way to allocate where every state's going to feel like they got a fair share of the quota. Thanks. Tennis match for us. <laughs> well, then, I mean, to me, that doesn't pertain to what the motion is. It's more for making a separate motion to get rid of allocation, to get rid of the quota system itself. So this is just a way to, to at least give the public to have a couple options that, you know, we're not just talking recent, we're talking fairly recent in 2002 to 2012. And that's kind of what the working group decided on. Any other discussion on the motion? Rob. Pretending I'm taking an eye exam to read that up front there. <laughs> and I'm wondering how many of those totals are under 907,671 9 pounds. I see a one up there somewhere, so I know that's not. Um, so again, I mean, that's just a reflection on what the technical committee advised uh, that I mentioned before. And, you know, I think we keep that in mind at some later date. Russ? I agree with you again. And, and it doesn't change the 2010 landings, which is still the same in those tables. Um, you know, all I'm looking for is that percent allocation column on the left-hand side after the state. That's the only thing that I want to see be put into the the addendum, not the rest of those landings from all the different time frames. So, you know, it's kind of misleading having the table up there in the first place. Yeah, the table, this is just basically a different allocation option, and the differences are um, this option um, provides more of a historical perspective, and those states that have more recent landings are more disadvantaged, will have to take a more dr dramatic reduction to get below the 2010 level. And the options that were presented in the draft addendum today um, weight more recent weight more more recent harvest history in the allocation. Doug. So 
So just a clarification, Russ, since you're focusing on the percent allocation here, would this option still include the minimum 2,000 uh, pounds for the states of Georgia, South Carolina, and New Hampshire? Okay, thank you. You didn't get that, Joe? <laughs> Yeah, that would have no change. The tables would remain exactly the same, except that you'd have those options for the allocation change. That's about it. All right, can we put the motion back on the screen? Russ? And it should read 2002 to 2012, I believe. What do you think, Joe? Got to do it again? Move to include the working group allocation recommendation from their August memo to the board as an option to include the three highest landing years from 2002 to 2012 for options two and three. Motion by Mr. Allen, second by Mr. Augustine. Let's have a brief caucus. All right, Kate just wants to clarify something that I think you guys know, but go ahead, Kate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to clarify that there are currently um, six different quota options currently in the addendum, and so the addition of this, there'll be going to be 12 different quota options in the addendum. Correct. I was trying to avoid that by doing some other things, but we didn't get anywhere, so. All right. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. All those opposed, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Null votes. One. Abstentions. Motion carries. Okay, still on yellow eels. Any other changes? Dan. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm concerned about option five that prohibits states that have the minimal 2,000 pound quota from participating in transfers and I'd like to see that struck. I'd like to, I'd like to see states that have the minimum 2,000 pound uh, quota if that goes forward to be allowed to transfer. I'll make that into a motion, Dan. Yeah, motion to uh, modify option five to allow uh, states with automatic 2,000 pound quotas to participate in quota transfers. Thanks, Dan. Do we have a second to the motion? Can I explain it? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a second? Let me get on the screen and see if we get a second, Dan, all right? Rick, we got uh, Bob, we got a second. Bob Lou, second to the motion. Go ahead, Dan. So as I read this, uh, I can imagine a scenario where uh, one of our law enforcement officers might uncover uh, a commercial fisherman or a dealer who uh, may not have reported, and suddenly we have this unexpected overage of just a couple of thousand pounds, but it might be 100% of our quota. So we may have to call a state with an underage and say, can we have fish? for next year so we can have this minimal quota. Um, and if and if the 2,000 pound level, um, if we don't take it, I, I just don't see the downside to flipping that fish to um, a state that needs it. All right, we're ready to so, so move to modify option five in section 3.1.2, quota transfers to allow states with a 2,000 pound quota to participate in quota transfers. Motion by Mr. McKernan, second by Mr. Ballou. Discussion on the motion, David. Thanks, I just wanna be clear, this doesn't in any way jeopardize us somehow going over the quota. I mean, the 2,000 pounds came from other states, and so it's sort of conservation neutral doing this. Is that is that right? Yes, I mean, that 2,000 pound would be accounted for in the annual quota. The reason that the PDT added this option was to remove the administrative burden of monitoring that uh, level of harvest. 
this motion would allow those states to transfer that quota. Other comments, Rob? Yeah, I have to oppose the motion. I think the basis for the uh, pounds being allotted are for harvest opportunities. Um, I know Dan makes a case that might occasionally pop up, but I really think that this is something that if it's not taken, then uh, so much the better for the resource. Thanks, Rob. Any other comments? All right, uh, Dan. Uh, there are um, six states at 2,000 pounds, so the total aggregate amount is only 12,000 pounds on a quarter that will be almost a million. So I think it's minimal. I'd urge you to support this. Okay, brief caucus. All right, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. All those opposed? Thank you. Any null votes? Abstentions? Motion carries. Still on yellow yields. Uh, Bob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have a suggested uh, addition or subtraction, but just uh, the suggestion that we add information to the addendum that reflects state landings over the periods that we're using to calculate the allocations. I, found, uh, I find tables uh, four and five uh, a bit confusing, and I think the public might as well, since they just, you know, they speak to the 2010 landings, then they speak to an allocation formula, which is based on a calculation of landings that I don't think shows up in the addendum. So I think to ease the process of helping the public understand how those tables were developed, we should provide that information. Thank you. All right, staff are saying they can do that. All right. Any other um, any other issues with yellow eel quote, uh, yellow eel options in uh, this addend draft addendum? Uh, Russell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just like to give a little bit of history on what Maryland has done to conserve eels over the years. About 25 years ago, or 20 years ago, we had a 3-8 uh, by 3-8 mesh uh, eel pot, which is the only way we can catch eels in Maryland. And about 15 years or so ago, we went to half by half. So we've increasingly, which that allows you as what the uh, up-to-date uh, uh, Lang States Marine Fisheries Commission had voted on, um, but we've had that for 15 years to conserve eels. Now, according to the technical committee, the eels wander up and down the coast, and they say, oh, we might go in that, man, we might go in there, we go in Delaware Bay or Chesapeake Bay, but somehow or another, we keep increasing in eels um, in Maryland. We're doing better and better, and uh, if, in my belief, it's because we've taken the measures to control what we catch. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. All right, let's move on to silver eels. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I don't feel bad that I've blown your record here for getting things done on time. So, um, I just wanted to go into um, a couple of things on the silver eel fishery and particularly into option four, but I just wanted to do a quick recap. Um, Addendum three and four, the, both the goals were to reduce uh, harvest of all life stages, and this, I think, was uh, from reports going back a year ago, was, was considered a pretty small fishery. But none of the addendums talk about completely eliminating a fishery. However, here we are a few months later, and we still have options that are going to completely eliminate this fishery. Um, so what I wanted to do is just a little bit of uh, a couple of facts, and I just want to modify uh, through a motion, a brief modification, which I think should be pretty quick. Um, first off, um, looking at this fishery, uh, there's a few things we've learned in the last few months. Um, again, going back to the data, we're talking about 0.5% of the coastwide landings. That's looking at a yellow eel fishery, because that's what this is. This is actually not a silver eel fishery. Most of the eels coming out, they're all yellow. Some percentage of them are going to out-migrate, but the majority of the, the eels are yellow eels, and the, and the eels that the fishermen want to keep are the smaller eels. They actually don't care about the larger ones, so I'll talk to that in a second. 
Um, the number of permits on this is varied, but we're only talking about at a height 15 permits. So re really, again, a very, very small, small fishery. Um, and back in May of 2013, the AP concurred that this was a small fishery and just recommended that there be a cap put on it. But then we got wrapped around the axle a little bit because there were some discussions about, and which were all unsubstantiated, about all these large females and impacts of the coastal population. None of this was realistic. I mean, we were talking about very, very small numbers. So we got to August. We agreed to put options back in that would cap this fishery. And again, now we've got to this addendum, um, and this addendum again has, uh, particularly through all the options in there, but the one talking about a cap option four is still eliminating the fishery. So I want to put a motion up to modify option four, but before I do that, I simply want to add in that, and I think this has been stated before, I think what we need to look at is the efforts that are going on across all the states that are trying to get at the yield population. New York is looking at not only, and not in this addendum, but with rear modification so we can increase passage of some of those some of the eels so that more are escaping to the ocean. Secondly, we, are, we would like to look at a manual release. Remember, these guys don't want the larger eels. They want the smaller yellow eels. And if we can come up with a size limit based um, cutoff that we, uh, above a certain size, they would release those. And we're getting more escapement of eels that are going to turn into silver eels. Again, a better conservation me uh, measure. And lastly, we have something called the New York Eel Project that's done through the Hudson River Estuarine Reserve, where they've been doing monitoring on glass eels and they're doing fish passage. They're essentially adding more things to this. We've got 250 volunteers and we're trying to get more money to get more eel passage upstream. So we're looking at the other aspects of this, not just what's going on in the fishery. So a lot of work going on in New York and in the other states, again, and I'm trying to get this, that we're preserving an artisanal fishery, very small, and we want to go with a cap, not a complete elimination of this fishery. So my motion is that I would move to modify option four. Want me to wait, Kate? Okay. Modify option four to remove the third sentence, and quote, once issued, licenses are not eligible for transferability, end quote. And modify sentence four to read, quote, this would result in a reduction of licenses, end quote. And all this does, Mr. Chairman, is essentially it, it essentially will we'll cap that the fishery, as the addendum says, we will identify that number through the public process. Uh, I don't know what that is exactly now, but obviously less than the 15 we've had. Uh, and then uh, essentially it would be capped at that. We would monitor it, and then it would go on that we would decide how to transfer those later on, but yeah. not eliminate the fishery completely. Thank you. Right, we got a second from Pat from Maine. Give staff a second to finish writing it up. Alrighty, move to modify option four in section 3.13 to remove the third sentence. Uh, quote, once issued licenses are not eligible for transferability, end quote, and modify the last sentence to read, quote, this would result in a reduction of licenses, quote, motion by Mr. Gilmer, second by Mr. Uh, oh yeah. Keller. Keller. Thanks. Discussion on the motion. Go ahead. I have a question um, for Jim. If if this is a silver oil fishery, but they're harvesting yellow eels, is what, what are we really talking about? Is this part of the yellow oil quota, or is it part of the silver silver eel uh, harvest? Well, right now, the way the addendum both has been, it, it was listed as a silver eel fishery because some percentage of them will will essentially out migrate and then you know metamorphose into silver eels um, uh, you know again uh, we, we'd have to go back and start if we put this back in the yellow oil fishery I think it's going to complicate it more 
Um, but technically, the majority of the eels are keeping, from my understanding, they're actually yellow eels. And why sorting them is more difficult is because none of them have silvered out at that point when they're catching them in the Delaware. Mitch? Uh, yes, I can support this motion, although I do have to question whether weirs that are targeting out migrating eels could be said to be anything other than targeting a silver eel fishery. But be that as it may, I think that New York's made a fair point about the fact that no other state has been asked to eliminate a fishery completely. And uh, in light of the f that's just an option. Here there, was, here there was no option that I believe would have allowed New York to keep that fishery, whereas in the silver, in the glass eel fishery, I think status quo is, is still an option. But in any event, if I misspoke, I apologize. Um, I, I can support the motion, and uh, I, I just think it goes to the point that watershed management and ecosystem management really needs to be our ultimate goal because when states do open up the possibility of having glass eel fisheries, uh, the folks in New Jersey and Delaware, in New York along the Delaware River are going to realize that they really can't have a glass eel fishery on this river. It's just too wide, too deep of a river to support a glass eel fishery. So it's important, I think, as a group that we give states the flexibility to manage their fisheries in a logical way consistent with the uh, geography and not just uh, based on you know, hypothetical principles. And just to add a background, all the other states were required to close during this period, but given the cultural, historical perspective of the fishery, that's why the board allowed that one-year extension to allow more discussion on this issue. Rob, John? Yeah, a couple of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jim, you had mentioned the number of licenses, and 15 came out, but I see in 2012 there was only a dozen. In 2013, did that go up a little bit, or was that just something that you were uh, speaking about? And a second question, just to get them both to you, would be you mentioned briefly getting a size frequency, and uh, would you expect pretty good cooperation with that to maintain a yellow eel, essentially, fishery, as you mentioned? Uh, yeah, to the first question, Rob, it, for both uh, 20, 2013, it was 10 licenses we issued, and again, this year we had another 10. And we were going to try to put a number in here. I think the uh, AP had, uh, I think, recommended six, but we wanted to go out to the public again to get a better handle of how many, you know, actual fishermen we have that are exploiting this versus how many guys are just getting permits. Um, so we're going to look at, again, they're, they're giving us landings information so we can actually try to ferret out the guys that have actually been doing this for, a, you know, for many years as opposed to the guys that are just trying to come up with an option of using this later on. Um, secondly, the, um, the, the only limitation we have in that, Rob, is defining that. Um, we may have to, um, and I talked to staff, I said, could we get this, that, that length, you know, cut off, whatever, defined, and they said it's probably going to take them, you know, a good year to get the data behind that and maybe, um, but from what I understand from the fishery, and again, we'll get this at the public comment period, is that, um, yeah, that would be pretty good cooperation because that's the value in the fishery of those smaller reels, not the big out migrators. Thank you. Got John and then Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jim, you say this is a yellow eel fishery, but they are fishing during the time you'd expect silver eels to be out migrating. So in addition to length data, I'd like to see some histological data from the, uh, the gonads of these things to prove that these aren't mature eels. I mean, we know the silvering doesn't occur all at once. So they, I mean, the time of year they're fishing for these things. And I would just like to reiterate that there's a good reason we biologically to close silver eel fisheries because we know those are eels that are heading out to spawn. So just want to leave it at that. Thanks, uh, Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Jim, I'm trying to understand the language in the, in, in the uh, amend or the motion. Um, it says, once issued, licenses are not eligible for transferability. And yet it ends with, this would result in a reduction of licenses. If licenses are transferable, how does it result in a reduction in licenses? Thank you. Um, my apologies, Roy. It probably would have been clearer if I had just rewritten the entire option. 
um, what it's going to do. If you look at the addendum itself, and if you go to option four, I'll read that and maybe that'll clarify. Because if you do this replacement that says under this option, the Delaware River Weir fishery would be limited to those permitted New York participants that fish and reported landings any time during the period 2010 to 2013. Figure six for the number of licenses issued annually of the number of active participants in the fishery. Um, that next sentence, the first one I was eliminated, that sentence is gone. And then only one license can be issued per, per, uh, issued per participant. And then this would result in a reduction of the licenses. The cap that we would put on is results in the reduction of the, of the licenses. So um, again, my apologies. I tried to do it quickly. And it's confusing based upon the sentences. But if you add those in, that's what ends up hopefully happening. All right, any other comment? I got Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Jim, I'm looking at this uh, figure six, and it looks like the upshot, if this were to go forward, this particular option as you're proposing to amend it, the reduction would be from about 12 to about 8 or 9. Does that jibe with, am I reading this correctly? Uh, and I'm, I'll pause and then I might have a follow-up. Is that what you mean by... This will result in a reduction of licenses, that being a reduction from a, about 12 to about 8? Yeah, Bob, that's correct. It could go lower, though. Again, we're trying to find out the, the true number of uh, traditional fishermen in this. So if it was only 6 or 7, we'd go down to that. And if I could follow up. So something dramatic happened, relatively speaking. I mean, we're talking about small numbers here, but uh, at 209, at, in 2010, and that is the number of participants in this fishery essentially doubled, if I'm reading this correctly, at least the number of licensed and close to being the number of licensed and active. So can you just speak to why the proposal here is to cap uh, at the post-2010 levels versus the prior 2010 levels? Thank you. Most of that, um, Bob, we got from the public meetings. Um, the, the, uh, I, I think the larger number of them that were actively fishing this um, were um, um, at the meeting, and essentially they said there's, it, it's, you know, it's uh, some years they get into the fishery to augment their income, whatever, and they've had good and bad years, so it just seemed to be more of a socioeconomic reason why this thing goes up and down. I mean, we look back to the, you know, the late 90s, and it was up to 15 permits. And some of those are the same guys, and there was like more guys fishing back then. So, um, again, we're trying to focus in on the guys that have really used this more as a tradition and also as a, a consistent form of their income. So, um, but that variability is, has been because of uh, just you know year-to-year -year variations in economics. All right, we got a motion on the table. We've had some discussion. Let's take a 15-second caucus and vote on the motion. Yeah. All right. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. All opposed, please raise your right hand. Any null votes? Any abstentions? One abstention. Motion carries. And the other... Uh, proposed changes to the civil eel section. Walter? Um, under the, the um, state specific sustainable FMPs, could New York reduce uh, turbine deaths and use that as an equivalency, for example, to, to keep this fishery open? Yes, that would be an option. All right, unless somebody objects, we're going to move on to the Sustainable Fisheries Management Plan section. Any suggested changes, additions, eliminations to that? Pat? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've got a motion. Um, I can either send it to you or I can um, just read it quickly. But I'd move to include item number 4 to 3.1.4. States would be allowed to harvest 
a maximum of 200 pounds of glass seals annually for the use in domestic aquaculture facilities if they can show that they can be harvested from a watershed does not, that does not contribute to the spawning stock of American eels. Thanks, Pat. We're going to get that onto the screen. So we'll just take a brief minute break. Hey, Walter. One suggestion from staff is to maybe change the word um, minimal no. instead of um, no, impact. no impact to the stock because it would be difficult to demonstrate there would be no impact. You okay with that change? Would the maker consider 750 pounds a friendly amendment? Hey, you weren't recognized down there. <laughs> All right, motion is to move to item number four in section 3.14. States would be allowed to harvest a maximum of 200 pounds of glass eels annually for the use in domestic aquaculture facilities if they can show that they can be harvested from a watershed that minimally contributes to the spawning stock of American eel. Motion by Mr. Keller. We have a second on the motion. We have a second, Richie White. Discussion on the motion. Dan? Is it necessary to clarify domestic aquaculture to mean grow out to minimum legal size? What? Yeah, okay, so we need to figure out a way to add that to the motion. Richie, you okay with that as well? Can I ask a question? Go ahead, Kate. Uh, just a question for clarification. Um, this option number four, would states be required to go through numbers one, really in two, or three, where it says that states must be able to assess with some level of com competence the status of eel abundance and current level of mortality that is occurring on the American eel populations within their jurisdictions. And then once adequately documented, states would be allowed to allocate the fishing mortality. So would this just be kind of like a, a separate item, not really number four, but it would just kind of be a separate item that would allow this? that makes sense? Uh, it, it, it does, Kate. It, it probably would be a separate item. Um, I, I mean, the, the, my my seatmate here said wanted to know how do we define minimally contributes, and I, I think from my perspective that would be a, a, a proposal that would come through a state to the technical committee to make that determination. Okay, thank you. That was my second question: is if there would be TC review on these proposals? Yes. All right, I will read it in a second, Joe. Dave? I just need some insight into aquaculture, and I'm, I'm, I can't picture how many large stainless steel tanks you'd need to grow out 200 pounds of glass eels to I don't know how many tens of thousands of pounds of legal size product. Do we have the proportions right? It just seems like that's a tremendous amount of little baby eels and... Uh, can anyone help me with the proportionality here? Hey, Marty. Uh, looking at the, um, the actually the plan for Mr. Uh, Mr. Daniels there, the 750 pounds would probably produce about 66 tons by the time it was nine inches. Sorry, 66 tons coming out of 750 pounds. Yeah, as 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 for the 700 pounds from baby eels off to a nine-inch eel. 
which would be equivalent to about 66 tons, which is about 140,000 pounds. Uh, that's a big farm. <laughs> Richie? Well, just some thinking to Dave's question. Um, doesn't mean you have to do the 200 pounds, uh, up to, and it, and it doesn't mean that it's one aquaculture project. Maybe there's six. Russ? Uh, just, just a quick question. Um, a state's not lim limited to harvesting the 200 pounds and using it in its own state aquaculture facilities. They could go to any state? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Sorry, I'm sorry, Joe. I was not I'm considering any limitations here. Okay, Roy. Mr. Chairman, with all due respect to Commissioner Kelleher, I'm having some problems with this particular motion. One, I don't know how to define minimally contributes. Um, that's a value judgment. And two, I'm trying to picture what what these runs would look like. Are, are we talking culverts up into a trickle, or what are we talking about? Because if if the eels in our state can't get access to fresh water, as John Clark has pointed out, they'll rear in estuarine waters. Um, so just assuming they don't have access to fresh water doesn't mean that they can't contribute to the spawning stock. So I, I guess I just don't understand the intent of the motion, although I agree uh, I'm not opposed, let's put it that way, to the concept of, of uh, using some quantity of glass eels to support aquaculture. Thank you. Pat? Thank you. So uh, I'll use um, the Young of the Year uh, site that we have in Maine. Uh, West Harbor Pond is where we collect elvers for, our, uh, for that Young of the Year assessment. That pond has zero to no oxygen at lower levels and does not support any populations of juveniles or adults. Once they're up within that system, there may be a few because they may be get they may be some way up in the upper part, but it does not contribute in any meaningful way. So if we are going to move to um, a full life cycle assessment, we would not use this site beyond what we do for glass eels at this time. So I'm I'm looking at some locations similar to that, not just picking a culverter. And I don't know if that helps, Roy, but. I don't really have a follow-up. Um, I, I believe what Pat is telling me. There may be a particular situation where there's absolutely no potential for rearing e e eels upstream of some, some impediment. But I, I just wonder, even in that particular system, I have to wonder, is there potential for rearing eels downstream of that impediment? All right, uh, Jim. Quick question. So, would these be transferable, Pat? Was that the idea of this? That it would be have transferability between the states? Yes. Lance? Yeah, I'd like <clears throat> just to weigh in on this because I was heavily involved 20 years ago in <clears throat> trying to get eel, glass eels farmed in Connecticut. And I fished them for two years. And uh, maybe 12 different streams, but most of them are small tributaries. And the biggest impediment I see to a lot of glass eel migration up is chlorine at the mouths of some of these very nice upstream habitats. And you wouldn't see an elver, you wouldn't see the glass eel runs. But in many of these little trickles, just as I would mentioned to Pat, you, you see you can catch five gallons of glass eels, and there's no headwater pond, or if, if there is one, there may be a half an acre pond, and the rest of it's trout stream. So a lot of that's a dead end situation. So it's real from from my observations, and uh, whether you can find it and uh, optimize on it. But I think we need to get started with some leniency on aquaculture for a trial basis. 
Thanks, Lance. Mitch? Yes, I'm going to uh, echo John Clark's sentiments that were expressed by Roy Miller. Um, eels, and by the way, I, might, I think I could support this motion, but uh, the use of the term uh, you know, minimally contributes is, is really problematic. Uh, eels make U-turns. They go, they go into the fresh water, and if, they're not, if they find that it's not appropriate habitat, they don't just sit there and die. They go back into the estuary, and Dr. Uh, Brian Jessup, renowned eel scientist in Canada, has done the strontium calcium analysis on the otoliths of eels, and he can verify that the majority of eels in any system migrate between the fresh water and the salt water throughout their life. A very sizable percentage of the eels live their entire life in the estuary and do not even uh, ascend to the fresh water. And Dave Cairns is going to produce a paper at the uh, Quebec Symposium indicating that p probably less than 10 percent of all eel habitat in North America is even subject to fishing because in fact most of that habitat is in the estuaries. So while I do think that watershed analysis is vitally important for us to understand where are the eels being recruited to. The, quite the suggestion that watershed analysis will tell us that certain eels are more important, certain watersheds are more important than others, uh, the eels in that habitat are more important than others, is, I, 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 can't, uh, I can't agree with that. So I might be able to support the motion, but some of the premises that we're talking about here are just inaccurate. They're just inaccurate. Thank you. All right, let's do a 30-second caucus, and I'll read the motion for you, Joe. Move to add item number four in section 3.1.4. States would be allowed to harvest a maximum of 200 pounds of glass eel annually for the use in domestic aquaculture facilities to grow out to the minimum legal size. If they can show that they can be harvested from a watershed that minimally contributes to the spawning stock of American eel. Motion by Mr. Kelleher, second by Mr. White. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. All those opposed, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Any null votes? Any abstentions? Two abstentions. Motion carries. Any other issues related to the sustainable fisheries planning section of the draft addendum? All right. They didn't note that we're going to be working on central time here. 345. Uh, Richie? Thank you. Um, in the glass eel section, um, uh, would it be possible to have, on, under any of the quota options that show a, a poundage, that we could also show the technical committee's recommendation for, for a coastwide quota, so that the, <clears throat> the people commenting on this they can uh, see that when they're deciding, you know, which option to take. So. Under the yellow eel section, there is a clear sentence that states what the technical committee recommendation is. But you're suggesting that something like that also be added to the glass eel section? That's correct. Let me do that. All righty. Um, moving forward, any comments on law enforcement section? Pat? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not. The, the colonel's coming up at a high rate of speed. Um, in, I was reviewing the law enforcement section on the way down, um, and I mentioned to Joe, I asked if he had a chance to take a look at that, and he said he did. And he thought um, there needed to be further discussion with the law enforcement committee, and it may need to be updated. So I didn't know if uh, the colonel wanted to comment on that. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, thanks a lot, Pat. Uh, actually, uh, we went over this a year or so ago, and since then we've developed this quota system in Maine. I'm pretty excited about it, and I've been asked to put on a presentation tomorrow about the quota system and how it's working in Maine. And I'd, uh, I'd like to be able to present that and maybe talk to the board tomorrow and, 
and see whether or not they'd like to review the uh, our comments and, and resubmit maybe. But certainly I'm just one member of the board. I have to go through the board and talk about it and just want to reserve that if I can. Pretty much it. Uh, these the comments in the document were provided um, based on an LEC conference call in in March at, before the start of the glacial season. Sorry about that. I thought we did those last year. I I missed that call of doing. No problem. All right. Any other comments on the law enforcement section? All right. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was jumping here. Um, is, is it appropriate to make a motion to approve this uh, document as amended for yes. public hearing? Yes, it is. So, and also make that motion. Seconded by Pat Augustine. So we got a motion, move to approve draft addendum four for public comment as modified today. Motion by Bill Adler, seconded by Pat Augustine. You guys need a caucus? Discussion on the motion, Pat? Yeah, and it's, it's just to clean up on page 11 under option two, second paragraph. It just refers to Maine DMR as Maine Department of Natural Resources. Uh, it just needs to be correctly referenced as Maine Department of Marine Resources. We'll make that change. Thanks. Any other uh, discussion? Uh, Rob? Yeah, at the discretion of um, staff, in the document you had mentioned there was a sort of a clear case for uh, the yellow eel fishery, the recommendations of the TC on page 18, which starts with the PDT and ends with subsequent addenda and talks about the 907,671 pounds if that could go in the front on 3.1.2 as the second paragraph, I think the public would see it. Right now it's sandwiched into the weighted yellow, yellow eel quota and uh, you know, it may, might not stand out as much. So just a suggestion if possible. Thanks, Rob. I think that's a good suggestion. Any other uh, comments before we vote on this motion? You guys ready to vote? All right. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. Uh, any, any opposed? No votes. Abstentions. Motion carries unanimously. Next item on the agenda is elect the vice chair. Pat? You saw that one coming. Uh, I'd like to nominate John Clark. Do we have a second? Pat Augustine? I make a second, and will we close nominations and cast one vote for the gentleman across the way, Mr. Clark. All right. No objections. No, are there any objections? All right. Welcome along, John. All right. Is there any other business be coming before the board today? Mitch? Yes, um, quick question. I don't know who I'm addressing it to. Maybe you, Bob. Uh, I understand that in the last several months, uh, the state of Florida issued elver harvesting permits for uh, multiple fishermen. And I was wondering if, I don't know if anyone's here from Florida, if, if, uh, if there's any update on uh, you know the status of that uh, process. I was under the impression that, uh, from talking to Bob, that Florida was aware that that was not in compliance with ASMFC's fishery management plan, and that it was uh, the intention of the Florida legislature to just it needed some time to pass the legislation to to clean that up. I was wondering if that was the case. Thank you. Hey, go ahead. Uh, that that does not have to go through our legislature, and we are going to our commission in September to request that we advertise a rule which we expect will be passed assuming there's no problems in November. Thanks, Jim. 
Any other business? Any objection to adjourn? Motion. <laughs> Meetings adjourned. Thank you all.